I'm going to give you a tour of the solar system since it was formed more than four and a half thousand million years ago. It was a building site like this with a lot of materials of different sorts like gas and rocks and metals. So the result that we see today are planets like the Earth with solid surface, which are a few thousands of kilometers wide. While on the other side, we have the giant planets which are made out of gas, and there are tens of thousands of kilometers wide. But if we go smaller to the dwarf planets and the moons of the solar systems that we have here, we have objects which are only a few hundred kilometers wide. Even smaller, we go to the dwarf planets, we go to Ceres and Vesta, a few hundred kilometers wide, and finally, we have asteroids, which are even smaller, from 100 meters to a few hundred kilometers only in size. There are ones that have more or less a solid surface with craters there that imply bombardment by smaller objects. And also we have this very kind of loose material, completely different from the others. There are a variety of materials there in the asteroid. Then we have the comets. The comets are very mysterious. They come from very far away. They have uh, very long tails that are ejected, uh, gas ejected by the proximity to the sun when they get hot. But the nuclei of the comets are, is the solid part of the comet and is made out of uh, rock mainly and mainly ice and other uh, substances that um, produce gases as we see in this picture here and this one here. But the sizes are only a few kilometers wide. They are not that big, these, uh, these rocks. Beautiful tails that develop as they go closer to the sun, millions of kilometers wide, while the nucleus is much, much smaller. Here we have a comet, almost vanishing away as he goes closer to the sun. This is the uh, images taken by the Soho spacecraft where the sun is occulted by a disk and this, uh, the white circle is the sun itself. So we see this comet uh, kind of uh, approaching, uh, approaching the sun. Finally, we have these meteors. The meteors are shooting stars and they are really, really tiny, it's like a mini, mini asteroids, if you like, only a few millimeters wide or even a fraction of a millimeter. They penetrate the atmosphere at enormous speeds of 70, 50 or 70 kilometers per second. And at that speed, the friction with the air makes them vaporize and they leave a trail that we see in pictures like this. And the bigger ones, a few millimeters wide, could leave a trail that we call a bolid, which is uh, a very bright uh, uh, shooting star. Several of them seen here around the constellation of Leo. And when they land, these meteors, if they are big enough, a few centimeters wide or tens of meters wide, they can uh, reach the, land, the, 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 the ground, produce little craters or big craters, depending, and they are called meteorites. This is an iron meteorite made, made out of iron and nickel. And there are other meteorites like this one, which is a rocky meteorite, a stony meteorite that contains not only uh, minerals, but contains also, in some cases, the building blocks for life, uh, organic molecules which is a very important aspect of the uh, information that we get from these rocks. One of them landed, an iron meteorite landed. Uh, it was 50 meters across. It landed in uh, uh, what is all today is Arizona about 20,000 years ago and produced this crater about one kilometer across. The largest uh, meteorite ever found on Earth is an iron meteorite in Namibia which is huge, it's 60 tons worth of iron and nickel here. That's the largest ever found. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone and uh, uh, welcome to our live event on the International uh, Asteroid Day. Uh, today, the 30th of June, is the
the anniversary of the Tunguska event in 1908, uh, 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 which happened 112 years ago. And uh, uh, the United Nations four years ago decided that uh, there should be a day to um, bring awareness about uh, asteroids and the potential threat that they, uh, that they bring. Uh, and we thought we'd join this, uh, the uh, range of events that happen on this day with our own little uh, event from uh, uh, UCL and, and, the, and Birkbeck. And uh, to, today with us are uh, myself and, and Mark Fuller, who is the uh, outreach coordinator for the physics department at UCL and Ogden officer. We have four team guests who will deliver us uh, some talks on asteroids and, 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 and tell us some interesting things about it. Uh, there will be uh, Dr. Marco Micheli from the European Space Agency uh, Near Earth Object Coordination Center, uh, Dr. Mohamed Rami Al Maari, who is a lecturer in planetary science from the De Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Birkbeck, University of London, uh, Professor Hilary Downs, who is a professor in geochemistry at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Birkbeck. And a professor of planetary science and astrobiology, Ian Crawford, who is also at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Birkbeck. Uh, over to you, Mark, to explain how uh, uh, everyone can join us in uh, asking questions. Thank you, Giorgio. Um, so today is all about asteroids, as you know, but we really want the audience to get involved. So please do join us on Slido, and the event code is Talking Asteroids. If you join us there, you can ask questions. Uh, you can have a look at the questions that are being asked already, upvote any that you're really interested in hearing about. And then at approximately five o'clock, we'll be going to our first uh, Q&A session where we'll be answering some of those questions. Now, we hope to get through as many as possible um, in today's session. But any that don't get answered, uh, we, what we'll do, we'll try and get answers to them and then post them up afterwards. And we'll be sending out something through the Eventbrite link to how you can access all those answers. So, without further ado, I think we just start the video. Hello, everybody. My name is Marco Micheli, and in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to what asteroids have and why they are dangerous for us, and in particular, what we are doing in ESA to take care of the danger of asteroids by doing all we can to predict and mitigate the threats that can come from these objects. Let's start with an introduction to what asteroids are. The object you see on the left is a very typical asteroid. As you can see, it looks like a rock, looks like a piece of stone. It's kind of irregular in shape, and most asteroids, especially the small ones, look like that. The one to the right, on the other hand, it's uh, more or less spherical, and it's the largest of the asteroids we know in our inner solar system. It's about a thousand kilometers in diameter. In terms of sizes, they go from this one, a thousand kilometers, down to very, very small sizes, down to basically pebbles. Now I want to tell you where asteroids are in our solar system. What you see here is an animation of the solar system. Each of the white circle is the orbit of one of the planets, starting from Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars, and out here the orbit of planet Jupiter. Each of the little dots you see is the position of a known asteroid. As you may notice, the vast majority of them are in this area between the orbit of Mars and the orbit of Jupiter. This is what we call the main asteroid belt, and these asteroids are the ones we don't really care about. They stay far enough from our planet, from the Earth, to not pose a threat to us. However, you can see that there are a few of the dots in here that actually come close to the Earth. These are the near-Earth asteroids, and these are the ones we care about because they are the ones that pose a threat to our planet. And to show you directly why that's a threat, I'm going to show you this video. This video was taken by people who were going to work in Russia uh, in 2013. What you are seeing there is an asteroid coming through the Earth's atmosphere, getting brighter and brighter, and then exploding, more or less at this point. What you don't see in the video is what happened about a minute or two after this explosion. The explosion happened in the atmosphere about 20 kilometers up, and it created a huge massive shock wave. And this shock wave propagated through the atmosphere until it reached the ground over the city that is under it, the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. 
the result was pretty major. The shockwave was so powerful then that a lot of buildings, fragile buildings, uh, industrial buildings or roofs, fell down, windows were shattered, and about 2,000 people actually got injured by the event. Fortunately, nobody died, but it was still a pretty major destruction for the city. And the asteroid that was capable of causing such damage on a major city was only 20 meters in size. So this gives you an idea of how powerful these asteroids are, even the small ones, even one that's just 20 meters in size. What you see here, on the other hand, is what happens when a 40 meter asteroid hits the Earth. This happened about 50,000 years ago in what today is the southwest of the United States. And uh, the hole you see there is about a kilometer in diameter. The difference between the previous video and this one is that in this case, the asteroid was not truly a rock, it was actually a piece of metal. And as you may imagine, metal is harder and it survives most of the entry to the atmosphere. So instead of exploding high up in the atmosphere, most of this asteroid reached the ground and basically punched a big hole in the ground. And this is the result of that punch. About a kilometer of a hole, there is actually some trace of the asteroid itself in the crater and all around in the form of small little pieces of metal, of chaplain, and these are meteorites generated by the asteroid impact. This image, on the other hand, shows you a forest, actually what remained of a forest, see a lot of trees that are basically kicked to the ground by something. This is the result of an explosion that happened in 1908 in uh, Siberia, not today is Russia. The explosion was caused by, again, an asteroidal object, we think of about 50 meters in diameter, that again entered the atmosphere and exploded in the atmosphere itself, creating this shock wave that hit the ground. And the result was about a radius of 70 kilometers around the, the explosion point that was basically completely devastated. Fortunately, it was a remote area, nobody lived there. It took about a decade for people to actually go there and uh, investigate what happened. But this is what a 50 meter asteroid can do can destroy 70 kilometers of radius around the impact point. So now just, just imagine if the same thing were to happen above a populated city, about a major uh, urban environment. The most famous of all asteroids is probably the one that about 66 million years ago fell on what is today the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And it was a big one, it was about 10 kilometers in size and it left a big crater about a hundred kilometers in size but most importantly it was responsible for what we today know as the extinction of the dinosaurs and about 70 percent of all living species on earth at the time this was a massive asteroid 10 kilometers as i said but if you compare it with the size of the earth which is a thousand times larger it still gives you an idea of how something relatively small in comparison with the size of the planet can completely devastate the whole planet and cause an ecological disaster on planetary scale. Now the previous images gave you an idea of how much damage an asteroid can cause. Now I'm going to give you a measure of the numbers with this plot and invite you to just focus on the bottom row of this table, this area. This is a set of histograms that tell us how many asteroids are there of each given size bin and uh, how many we know of. If you look at the rightmost side of the plot, you see the large ones, the ones that are bigger than a kilometer. And uh, you see that we know about 98% of the ones we think exist, 914 out of 930. And that's reassuring, it means that We've spotted almost all the major ones, and we know that at least for the next century or so, it's highly unlikely that a big massive asteroid can come and hit our planet and cause the kind of devastation that happened to the dinosaurs. However, if you go to smaller scales, 
you see a very different scenario. For example, these are 100 to 300 meter asteroids. These are still pretty big. These are still objects that can cause significant damage to a country. And as you can see, we think there are about 30,000 that can come close to the Earth, and we know about 5,000 of them. So in this case, we are far from being complete. And there could be objects of this size scale that can be coming right now towards us, and we need to have telescopes and uh, projects to be ready to observe them in time. And uh, what is ESA doing, the European Space Agency doing, to prevent this, to do our best to mitigate this threat? Well, it opened a program that deals with threats from space to Earth. And uh, they've identified a few threats, the threat of artificial objects falling on the Earth, the threat of the Sun releasing energy towards the Earth and affecting the Earth, and the threat from asteroids, from near-Earth asteroids. This third part is where I work, and it's what I'm going to talk to you about in this, the rest of this talk. So the first step to do something about asteroids is to know that they exist. And uh, to know they exist means to discover them. The discovery of new asteroids is done today with what we call survey telescopes. They are mostly automated telescopes that every night they scan the sky, the night sky, they take pictures of the sky and they look for anything that moves. Right now, most of them are in the United States, but ESA is building its own. It's almost ready. It will be installed in southern Italy, in Sicily, I, hopefully in one or two years. And it will be the European contribution to discovering new asteroids coming towards us. Discovering, however, is not enough. The survey telescope that I just presented to you they just spot the new asteroids and automatically tell the world, they tell astronomers, look, there is a new asteroid coming from that direction. But they don't keep an eye on them. To keep an eye on the asteroids, we need other telescopes. We need what we call follow-up facilities. And follow-up telescopes are typically bigger telescopes that are dedicated to monitor the most important new discoveries. Not all of them. Most of the asteroids that we will discover will be boring, they will be the ones between Mars and Jupiter. We don't really care about them because they're not a threat for our planet. But the fraction that are a threat, well, we need to keep an eye on them with the best technology we have. And uh, this is what these telescopes are for, among other things, obviously. One thing I want to point out, this is just three of these telescopes. You see where they are? There's like South America, North America, Europe. They're really all over the world. And this is really good. This is good for two reasons. Technically, it's good because sometimes we need to react very fast to an asteroid and we need to have a telescope immediately available straight away to get the observations we need. And sometimes we may need to be in a particular area of the, of the Earth where it's dark, for example, or where the sky is clear. So we need access to telescopes that are distributed all over the planet. And the second reason why this is actually pretty good is that it shows that this is really a worldwide community. We at ESA in Europe, we are using telescopes that are literally all over the planet and people all over the planet are using telescopes everywhere, including in Europe, to make this a really truly coordinated effort among nations, among countries and among space agencies all over the planet to do our best to get all the data we need to keep track of these asteroids. Now, as you may imagine, professional telescopes are not the same as the small telescopes you may have at home. You don't look through them with your eyes, you take pictures through them. And this is an example of a picture of the sky taken with one of the big telescopes that I've just shown you. You can see a lot of little dots that are stars and galaxies. Some of them are actually asteroids, but you don't see them, you don't recognize them because they look like stars. So in order for you to be able to spot the asteroid, you magnify on this area of the image I'm going to make it into a negative that shows better on screen, but most importantly, I'm going to make it a video. Now, instead of having one image, you have a sequence of images taken consecutively with the telescope. And now you see there is something different. There is something that moves there. So I'm going to do this as a little game for you, give you some time to spot the asteroids yourself. It's pretty simple. You just have two rules. Real asteroids move in a straight line and real asteroids are visible in every image of the sequence. They don't appear and disappear. 
So there are four asteroids in this frame. Two are really easy, and I'm just going to point them out to you. Now your goal is to find the other two. I'm going to give you five seconds to think about, and then I'm going to show you the answer. Just uh, see if you, found, if you spotted them. So, if you are good, you should have seen a reasonably bright one right there in F6. And if you're really good, you may have seen another one that is much, much fainter down there in the corner, B8. The reason I'm showing this to you is not just because it's a kind of a fun game, but also because that's exactly what we astronomers do when we look at asteroid images. You may be able to write a pro computer program that does this for you, that looks for the moving asteroids, but any computer program that we've been able to develop is not as good as the human eye. We are still better at this. The bright ones, maybe the three brighter ones, you could easily write some software to spot them. The really faint one in the corner, that one's too faint for machines, but it is visible for our eyes. We are still better adapted and more naturally skilled at this than any machine we've been able to develop. And I think that's a nice message to keep in mind. So why do we do this? We take these images and we spot these asteroids because the goal is to measure their position in the sky. We do this, that's called astrometry, not on one night, not just on just one image, but on different images taken on different nights. And uh, the result is to have Let's assume three different positions of the asteroid on three different nights in the sky. These three positions can now be used to estimate the motion of the asteroid in the sky and to fit what we call the orbit of the asteroid. So to de determine mathematically what is the trajectory of the asteroid in the sky, in the solar system. And that's useful because with this orbit, we can now predict the future motion of the asteroid. We can predict, for example, that tonight the asteroid will be there. But it's a prediction and it's an extrapolation, so it's not going to be perfectly accurate. It will have an uncertainty. We will know that the asteroid will be more or less inside the ellipse you see there. The goal now is that we take a telescope again and we point the telescope right there to cover that ellipse and we see where the asteroid really is. So let's assume it's there. It's not in the center, it's somewhere in the uncertainty. And this is good because now we have four points. And now we can compute a much better orbit for the asteroid by going to the four points. And this orbit will allow us to predict the position of the asteroid in the future better. And it will allow us to repeat the cycle over and over by again predicting, reobserving, and improving the orbit and improving the prediction. And this is the end result of all the work we do. This is what we call the risk list. It's a, a table of asteroids that we know where they are, but we cannot exclude that in the next century will come close enough to the Earth to be a threat. This table is taken from our website. I invite all of you to go to this website, neo.ssa.esa.int, and uh, in there you find everything we produce at ESA to inform you, the public, and the scientists of the asteroid threat. The risk list, what you see here, is probably the main, the most important product. It has some tables. I'm just going to quickly explain to you what they mean. The main column is this one, is what we call the impact probability. The table is basically telling you that uh, for each of these asteroids, they have this probability of impacting the Earth on this date. And as you can see, well, this is actually just the top of the table. These are the top 10 positions. If you click down here, you can get the whole list, which is about a thousand asteroids right now. What this table is telling you is that, for example, this asteroid has a one in 14 ch chance of impacting the Earth in year 2095. But we're not really worried because it's actually a small asteroid. As you can see, it's only eight meters in size. So it will mostly disintegrate in the asteroid, in the atmosphere, even if it were to hit. And if you go to the table, you see there are some others, for example, this one, 700 meters, but it's a probability of less than one in a million. So we don't really care that much about it. And if you look at it, the table, you'll see that 
most of them are not really worrying us. Right now, we don't know of any asteroid that is really scary, that is really posing a threat to our planet. But we have been worried. We have been worried at least once in 2004 when astronomers found this little guy, which we now call Apophis, and uh, just after discovery, we did the same computations and uh, turned out that this object had a 3% chance of hitting the Earth in year 2029. So only 25 years after discovery. And Apophis is big. Apophis is about 300 meters in size. So it's something that can take out a small country, basically. So we had a 3% chance that 25 years in the future of the time, something could come and destroy a country on our planet. That was scary. So what happened? Well, astronomers used telescopes again, as I explained, to observe it and to get better data, and we could compute better orbits of it, for it. And the result was that Apophis is actually not going to hit us in 2029. We got lucky. It's going to come very, very close to our planet, though. And uh, I suggest you mark this date. If you have a calendar on your phone that goes to year 2029, mark the date in 2029, on the 13th of April, you will be able to see Apophis with your naked eye by just stepping outside your home, looking up, if it's clear. It will be so bright that it will be visible to the naked eye as a little star that moves across the sky. And it's a really unique event, so I suggest uh, that you do it when the chance comes, because typically an asteroid comes that close and becomes that light, right only once every thousand years or so. So now you're good, right? Now you spotted there is another one there. Has it ever happened that an asteroid was spotted in the sky, predicted impact, and it actually did impact the Earth? Yeah, it has a few times. And the first time was in 2008, when this little asteroid was found, and it was predicted to be on an impact trajectory, colliding with the Earth only about 20 hours after discovery. It was fortunately a very small one, so nobody was really scared, but it was good because we could observe it more and predict exactly the impact point. It turned out to be in the north of Sudan, in the middle of the desert, where nobody lives, so that was reassuring. And uh, at the exact time that we predicted the asteroid was going to hit, meteorolo meteorological satellites like this one saw a little flash, you see this thing, it's a little flash of light coming exactly from the point where the impact had been predicted to occur. And a few days later, people went to the desert. Obviously, it's a pretty remote location, so it wasn't easy to get there. But they did find little pieces of rock that are what we call meteorites, and they have the remnant, the fragments of the asteroid that impacted on the Earth. And this is actually pretty good because it shows us that we can do everything. We can do the whole process from discovery to locating the impact point and to actually predicting exactly where and when the impact will occur. Now the question is, is there something we can do in case we spot a much bigger one coming towards the Earth? And the answer is yes, there is a technology, and uh, it's actually reasonably simple in space terms. It's just uh, launching something heavy on the top of a rocket and smashing it on the asteroid to give it a kick. And this small kick might be enough, if we do it early enough, to change the trajectory of the asteroid a little bit and have the asteroid miss the Earth instead of hitting it. It's called Kinetic Impactor. It's a technology that NASA and ESA together are trying to test with a dedicated mission which will target an asteroid called Didymos. And Didymos is actually pretty interesting because it's not a single asteroid, it's a binary asteroid. There is a main central asteroid and there is a little moonlet around it. The goal is that NASA will send a spacecraft smashing into the small moonlet and uh, a few years later ESA will send another spacecraft that will go there and uh, carefully analyze the system. This way it will be able to accurately measure if the satellite of the system has been moved in its orbit around the primary object. And by seeing how much it has been moved, we will be able to directly estimate how effective the impact was. And this is very important because it's the kind of information we need in case we have an another different asteroid coming towards us and uh, in case we need to mount a similar mission, we need to have a sort of a scaling measure to be able to estimate how big 
and how fast the projectile needs to be to cause the amount of deflection we need for this actually threatening asteroid to miss the planet. To conclude this presentation, I'm going to show you an image that may look like the ones you've seen before with an asteroid moving across the stars, but it's actually pretty different. What you're seeing there, it's not an asteroid, it's actually a car. You may remember that a couple of years ago, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and the founder also of SpaceX, the space company, wanted to test a rocket and to do so, decided to put a, his car on top of the rocket and fire it into space. The result is what you've seen in these images. This is Elon Musk's Tesla moving across the stars. The reason I'm showing it is to give you a scale of what telescopes can do. That's a car about a million kilometers away, away from Earth. So we actually have telescopes that can easily see something that small, that far away. And if we can see a car, we can actually see an asteroid of similar size, and we can also see something bigger, maybe when it's even farther away. It gives you a sense of scale of how powerful these telescopes are. And then it's just a question of being there, spotting the right asteroid at the right time to be able to set up all the machinery you've seen and uh, put it in motion so that we can do something in case that object turns out to be threatening for our planet. Thank you very much. Now I'm ready to answer any question you may have for me about my presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on Asteroid Day in this virtual meeting. And I would like to hopefully give you in the next 20 minutes a brief uh, overview our, of our model of how our own solar system formed to try to better understand and rather ask, uh, answer the very basic question of why do we even have an asteroid belt in our planetary system. So let's journey back around 4.6 billion years ago to try to answer that question. Now obviously no one was there to witness the birth of our sun and the formation of the solar system, but what we can do is build a scientific theory or a model of how um, our solar system formed based on its current architecture, based on the current observations that we've done and, uh, and the scientific facts that we know about our own solar system. Now, just like any other scientific theory, uh, our theory would need to stand the test of time and potentially should be able to predict future observations as well. If new observations, however, were to come to light that are not predicted by a scientific theory in general, uh, we would need uh, to revise it uh, or make some modifications. And that applies as well to uh, our current theory of solar system formation. And the reason why I bring this up is that during the past few years, uh, there has been a discovery of thousands of exoplanets, other planets that uh, are orbiting other planetary, other, other star systems. And they have an architecture that is somewhat different than our, our current uh, so, than our solar system. So uh, a lot of researchers uh, have been looking at refining or updating our current theory of solar system formation to explain not just how our own solar system formed, but how can we form as well these other planetary systems. But for the purposes of this talk, we will focus on the uh, current aspects of the theory that explain how our own solar system formed. So what are the main characteristics of our own solar system that we would need our scientific theory to explain? So first of all is the current configuration of our own solar system. And if, you'll, if, you, see it, if you see this diagram, you will note that the major planets are, are uh, sort of grouped into two main groups. We have the inner planets closer to the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And these are predominantly made up of rocks and metals. And then we have a second, a second group, an outer group of gas and ice giants. And these are larger in size, albeit less dense. And they're also uh, not just composed of rocks and metals, but they also have volatiles. And in the case of Jupiter and Saturn, they also have uh, a considerable inventory of light volatiles such as hydrogen and helium. Apart from the uh, grouping of the planets, we also have two main concentrations of small bodies orbiting the sun in our solar system. These are the asteroid belt, which is the main focus of our talk, which lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And if we were to look further to the right, 
Beyond the orbit of Neptune is another belt of small bodies called the Kuiper Belt. And our current theory would need to explain why we actually have these two belts of small bodies in our system. If we were to look at our own solar system as well, sort of sideways, we will note an, another aspect as well of our solar system, and that is the planets and most of the bodies are orbiting the sun in sort of an equatorial plane. Everything is sort of lying in a disk orbiting the sun, more or less. If we were to look at that disk from above, if we were able to do this, we will also notice that uh, the planets and most of the bodies of the solar system are orbiting the sun in a counterclockwise if we're looking at it from above. So we need to, to explain as well why we have everything sort of in a disk shape around the sun and why is it orbiting around the sun the way it does. So our current theory of solar system formation is based on the nebular hypothesis, which was first laid out actually, I think, back in the 18th century. And the nebular hypothesis stipulates that our, that our sun and, our, and the planetary system developed from a gravitationally collapsing nebula. Now nebulas, like the ones that you're seeing here on this slide, uh, are abundant in the, in, the, in the universe. They're interstellar uh, clouds of cosmic dust and gas. And there's, uh, these are what, uh, a lot of these are what astronomers would refer to as star nurseries, because these are the areas where stars are born and eventually a lot of these stars would have their own planetary systems. Now in order for these nebulae to start producing stars, you need to have a gravitational collapse. You need to have sort of a trigger where gravity would start to act and attract bodies next to, close to each other, allowing these things to grow up, create stars, and, uh, and, other, uh, and other components of a planetary system, particularly planets. So what is that trigger? It could be the interaction of two clouds, for instance, that starts to push material close to each other. It could be the explosion of a nearby supernova, um, a star, exploding star, a supernova. And the gravitational waves uh, resulting from that explosion would uh, maybe push things towards each other and trigger uh, the whole process to start collapsing a nebula. But regardless of the trigger, let's assume that this happens. So we start to init we initiate gravitational collapse in a nebula. And as a result, it starts to contract as materials are gravitating towards each other. And when this happens, three main effects will take place as the nebula contracts. And the first thing is you're going to get more collisions. So materials, because they're gravitating towards each other and, and it's contracting, there is less space between individual grains uh, and, and pieces, and you start to get a lot more collisions. As you get more collisions, you're going to get higher temperatures. And as a result, the early nebula will have very high temperatures, particularly though towards the center, as you're concentrating more mass towards the center, you have also more collisions there. So you get this temperature gradient where the center of the nebula is extremely hot, and as you move further away, it becomes uh, relatively colder and colder. So that temperature gradient is very important to us in, 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 in the framework of explaining why we have uh, uh, rocky planets in the center, towards the center, and the ga gas and ice shines towards the outside of the nebula. And this is something we'll go further into in a few slides, hopefully. Now the third part, a uh, third effect that's going to take place uh, in a contracting nebula, as you're getting more collisions and you get that temperature gradient, as the mass is being concentrated towards the center, just like a skate dancer moving their, uh, their, uh, their, their arms uh, close to their body in order to spin faster, due to the principle of conservation of momentum, as you're concentrating the material towards the center, if your nebula is starting, had actually already a small rotational component, it will start to spin faster and faster as you're concentrating the mass towards the center. And as the spin increases, you will get also tidal, uh, tidal forces and your sort of spherical nebula would flatten out into a disk shape or what we call a protoplanetary disk. And now that already gives us good indications of why most of the bodies are actually lying in sort of an equatorial plane around the sun. It's because that nebula has already uh, morphed into a protoplanetary disk. And what we have here is a diagram, a video simulation of how that happens, where you have a gravitationally collapsing nebula 
sort of morphing into a protoplanetary disk. Uh, notice the spin, no, sorry, note the, the rotation of the nebula, uh, in that particular case counterclockwise, similar to our own solar system. Notice at some point already the star has been born in the center where the temperatures are highest and where you've collected enough mass for thermonuclear reactions to take place and for a star to be born. The other parts, outer parts of the nebula are less dense, but eventually even there, materials gravitate towards each other for first forming 10 kilometer size, kilometer size planetesimals that further grow into protoplanets and eventually grow into planets. And if you've noticed in this uh, video simulation, you'll see that the planets simply inherited the rotational direction of the nebula itself. And that's why most of the bodies in the solar system are orbiting in counterclockwise. Basically, they've inherited the uh, rotational direction of the nebula uh, from which they formed. Now, if we were to look, go back to that temperature gradient, because that will tell us something about the uh, grouping of our planets. Again, reminder, the highest temperatures are in the middle, and this is where the star is born. But as you move further away, as the temperature drops, uh, you will get uh, sort of st different stability regions. So the nebula is starting off as very hot, it's in a gaseous state. But as you move further away, the temperature is dropping. And then generally with time, the whole nebula is understandably cooling down. So the first uh, things that are going to condense are the rocks and metals. And uh, they are going to condense sort of everywhere once it hits a certain temperature. Now in the inner part of the nebula, where it's quite hot, the first things that condense are the rocks and metals. But during that time, the volatiles are, uh, cannot condense because it's still too hot for them to do so. And as a result of this, the first thing that condenses are the rocks and metals. Now, at the same time, this, the sun, we think the early sun was uh, extremely active and uh, more active than it is today. And it emitted very strong stellar winds that we think pushed the, uh, the lighter volatiles away from the inner part of the solar system. And that's the reason why we think the inner part of the solar system only contains rock and, and, and metal-rich planets. And because these constitute a very small component of the nebula overall, in fact, the composition of the nebula, metals and rocks maybe constitute less, far less than 1%, uh, these bodies were never allowed to grow uh, into a very large size. However, and uh, if we were to look to the outer, outer parts of the nebula, uh, when it was cold enough, we had already, of course, the rocks and, and metals had condensed, but we also had an inventory of volatiles that could also condense. And as a result, these bodies were able to grow larger in size. And in fact, once they grew to a size large enough, they were able to gravitationally hold on to even the very light volatiles such as hydrogen and helium, which allowed them to further grow in size by incorporating hydrogen and helium from the, uh, from the nebula. And that is particularly the case with Jupiter and Saturn. So that's why these, uh, these outer planets were able to grow so much in size relevant in, 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 in uh, relative to the inner planets, it's because they contain volatiles and because they became large enough to trap the hydrogen and helium, something the inner planets could never do uh, due to their size and due to the activity of the early sun pushing a lot of these uh, lighter elements from, uh, away from the inner part of the nebula. Now, all this is really nice. Do we have observational evidence from this? So, Basically, first, the, our theory was built on the observations and facts that we know about our own solar system. But as I said, a theory would need to stand the test of time when there are new observations. And in fact, uh, advancements in Earth-based and space telescope and, and, and space observations have allowed us now to observe in detail other nebulae and other, and other planetary systems being formed. And as, and as you can see in this image here from one of the nebulas, you can actually see as we zoom in into different parts, evidence for stars being born and uh, the surrounding material around them that could uh, eventually create solar systems and planetary systems around these stars. So we are starting to have these, this observational evidence uh, showing us this process in, mo uh, in reality. 
Now, this is even a, a much better observational evidence where we have uh, an image uh, taken by um, an Earth-based telescope, I believe, uh, superimposed over a, a Hubble Space Telescope image where you can clearly see a protoplanetary disk so this is a system that has already, this is a nebula that has already gravitationally collapsed, created a protoplanetary disk, and, uh, is a, and you, can, you can see towards the center that there's, uh, there's probably already a star born in the middle. And if you notice, you'll see there are rings and gaps within that disk. And these are the areas where we think planets are being formed in these areas. And the reason for why you have these gaps is they're already starting to clear the neighborhood around them as they're orbiting their, the inner parts. Uh, as they're crowding, as they're orbiting their, their star, they're accreting materials, and, uh, and as a result of this, you're getting the gaps in the flattened nebula or the protoplanetary disk. So this is, again, a very nice image of a, pla a planetary system in the process of forming, a very nice observational evidence that seems to uh, be consistent with our theory of how our own solar system formed. So now we have a sort of a better understanding of how our own solar system came to have these groupings of planets. Let's now switch our focus into these small bodies. So we have the asteroid belt and Kuiper belt. Why do we have these belts? And what are these small bodies? So generally speaking, the, all the small bodies are leftovers from the formation process of the solar system. These are planetesimals uh, that were never able to get to grow into planets. They were never incorporated into planets for various reasons. And here you can see actually image uh, uh, a, a number of such small bodies, not just asteroids, that have been visited by spacecraft. So on the left is a bunch of asteroids, but you can also see Comet 67P of Gerasimenko. You also have Arakoth, which is a Kuiper belt object located in the Kuiper belt. Um, but let's focus now on the asteroids, and I'm going to use uh, 21 Lutetia as sort of a, an example of such an asteroid. This asteroid was the target of a flyby of the Rosetta spacecraft on its way to Comet 67P. If you look at this, the, that asteroid uh, showcases sort of the basic uh, attributes of an asteroid. It's, it's small, irregular in shape. It has a lot of impact craters on it, which means it's quite old. And in fact, it's, sorry, it's as old as the solar system itself. And these asteroids are mainly composed of rocks and metals, uh, but can also contain carbon-rich compounds and some ice. So for, uh, in that respect, we consider asteroids as the building blocks of the inner planets, the rock and metal planets. So if you want to study, get a better understanding of how these planets formed, what are the conditions, we look at asteroids. And as it happens, asteroids are also the main source of meteorites that fall on Earth. So we actually have a lot of these asteroids on Earth, chunks of them that we can study in detail. Now, most of the asteroids are situated in the asteroid belt, but many of them reside closer to Earth, and some of them we even call near-Earth near asteroids. So the, re the, the question here is, and these are some sort of some examples of these near-Earth asteroids. Uh, that have been actually visited by spacecraft. And in, in fact, the one that you see on the right, Bennu, uh, is an asteroid that is currently uh, uh, the target of an on ongoing NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx that is planning to collect a sample from this near-Earth asteroid and return it to Earth. And in fact, Ryugo, that you see there as well, is uh, a similarly near-Earth asteroid that was visited by a Japanese mission called Hayabusa-2, which also collected samples uh, from this asteroid and is bringing them uh, back to Earth. So how did they get here? And this is a question of relevance because it would tell us a lot about the asteroid belt itself and the processes that act on it. So these near asteroids are close to the sun because of a process called resonance. So if we were to look at the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt, which you can see in the plot on the right, you'll see there are actually certain gaps at certain distances from the sun. And these gaps are what we call gravitational resonances with Jupiter. So for instance, the three to one there is an area of the, of the belt where bodies, if, you, if they were in this location, they would orbit the sun three times when Jupiter orbits the sun one time. And these sort of ratios of orbits with a larger body 
uh, in that particular case, Jupiter, create either stable orbits or they create unstable orbits where bodies could not actually lie in these locations for uh, a significant amount of time because they would be the um, they would be affected by gravitational forces from that larger body in that case jupiter so what is jupiter doing here is that it's you, you can clearly see it has a gravitational influence on the asteroid belt and it's actually the main reason why bodies in the asteroid belt were never able to form a planet in its own right because of that gravitational influence of jupiter furthermore these resonance orbits a lot uh, lead to if you have any sort of migration due to collisions, and this is something that happens a lot during the, in the, in the, that happens in the asteroid belt, then anything that starts to fall into these sort of resonance orbits with Jupiter will get kicked out eventually from the asteroid belt by the influence of Jupiter. Uh, some of it might get kicked out of the solar system entirely. Some of it might get at, uh, maybe attracted uh, to Jupiter. And, and some of it is actually pushed towards the inner part of our own solar system. And that's how the near-Earth asteroids came to be close to Earth due to the gravitational influence of Jupiter. So resonance is, in fact, one of the main reasons for no planet forming in the asteroid belt. So thanks to Jupiter, all these bodies situated in the asteroid belt never had the chance to form a planet like the, uh, uh, like the inner planets. And the, same re and the same thing, the resonance, is partly the reason why we actually have no planet in the Kuiper Belt region. That's why we also have a Kuiper Belt towards the outside. In that particular case, Neptune is playing the role that Jupiter is playing in the inner part of the solar system, but even less so, but particularly less so because Neptune is less massive than Jupiter. However, in the case of the Kuiper Belt, it's not just Neptune that is, uh, is sort of preventing uh, these bodies from accreting into a large body, but as you're moving, as you're so far away in the nebula, as well in terms of density of materials it's much lower than the inside of the uh, of the it's much uh, it's much denser than the inner part of of the nebula during its formation and as a result this area is less dense less collisions which means there was less chances for materials to accrete together and form a planet so there are these two main reasons why the kuiper belt never uh, formed a large planet that we know of we might down the line maybe find a planet or something that would uh, that would uh, uh, force us to maybe revisit uh, this this aspect of the theory. But so far, this is our best understanding for why we actually do not have any large planet in the Kuiper Belt region. So I'm going to go very quickly to the Kuiper Belt because it has very nice comparisons with the asteroid belt and gives us a little bit more information as well about our own solar system in general. So the Kuiper Belt is this equatorial torus shaped region beyond the uh, beyond planet neptune uh, around 30 to 55 astronomical units away now we actually visited that area with a spacecraft recently uh, first of all uh, there was a flyby by pluto which is considered a kuiper belt object by the new horizon space mission a nasa mission back in 2015 and that the same spacecraft actually had a flyby of a small kuiper belt uh, in first of january 2019 which we call Arakoth, which you can see here uh, in this uh, beautiful image on the right. And you can see from that image that these, this Kuiper Belt object uh, sort of binary, uh, which is very similar to a lot of comets. You will notice that it's extremely primordial. It's in fact as old as the asteroids, but you do not see a lot of impact craters on it. And, uh, and that's because of the very low density of the region as a whole, as we as as I spoke earlier. So that there, has, there hasn't been a lot of collisions compared to what's happening in the asteroid belt, which is, where it is relatively more crowded and you get more collisions. So in terms of looking at a primordial shape, uh, this is as close as you can get for how a planetesimal looked like 4.6 billion years ago. And if we were to look at the Kuiper belt objects, we would consider them as the building blocks of the gas and ice giants because these bodies are composed of rocks and metals, but also a significant uh, volatile component. So the Kuiper Belt objects are to the ice and gas giants what the asteroids are to the inner planets. So we've come to the conclusion of our talk. I'll leave the summary slide uh, for you to look at, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.
Thank you very much for your attention. Hello and welcome to some questions answered as part of our International Asteroid Day event. Uh, so first of all, we're going to look at some statistics of asteroids. Uh, the first question to be answered is, have all the big near asteroids been discovered? Uh, and then if that's true, then are the only asteroids left to find small ones? And in that case, are we safe? Can we see the big ones coming years in advance and small ones don't matter anyway? And finally, what kind of damage are we talking about anyway, which is what many are worried about. So my name is Giorgio Savini and I'm from the UCL Observatory. I'm going to try to answer some questions on asteroid statistics. So first of all, we talk about big and small when it comes to near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids. What does that really mean? So here on the right, you have a plot, a picture which comes from uh, NASA JPL from the WISE Consortium. The WISE is a 40 centimeter uh, telescope which is in Earth orbit uh, and is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And this figure shows you uh, uh, approximately how many asteroids we expect, we know of their existence of, and how many do we expect to be missing in the count. Each of these represents 100 objects, and it gives you roughly an idea of what we know and what's missing in our picture. So as the objects, as the asteroids become smaller, there's still quite a few to find. And when we go below 100 meters, we really don't know exactly how many. Uh, as a size comparison, you can think of a 100 meter asteroid completely covering uh, 747 and a 300 meter asteroid here is compared to the to the London Tower Bridge. So how many asteroids do we expect there to be? Well, there's a very good plot from Harrison de Brahma from 2015 that shows you uh, as a uh, as varying size uh, diameter. So this is a kilometer, 100 meters and 10 meters. How many? What's the population number of these objects that we expect? And as you can see, this is a, a, a log 10 scale. So in each of these lines, the factor is about factor 10. So if we if we expect uh, roughly um, the order of thousand objects uh, with one kilometer in size, then we, we expect more than 20 million uh, when it comes to objects of 10 meter in size. And that's well and good, but how does big actually relate to dangerous? I mean, what do these objects uh, do when they interact with the atmosphere or when they reach the ground? So to give you an idea, there's this other very good plot from Brown et al. in 2002 uh, that gives you um, equivalent diameter on the top, which is a sort of a reproduction of the x-axis, and at the bottom, a correspondence in the energy of this object if it explodes in either the atmosphere or when it reaches the ground. So you can see a one and a 10 or a 100 and a 1,000 uh, meter diameter corresponding to the given energy. And the frequency on the y-axis tells you how many you'd expect of these events per year. So to help us out, we draw some horizontal lines. And this line here uh, is one event per year. So we expect a few meters uh, asteroid to impact every year with, with our planet. Uh, if we go down to about one or two meters, we expect something of the order of 10 of these per year. And if we go down to, uh, say, 20, 30 meters, we expect one of these to hit Earth every 100 years or so. Now, comparing this to events that we are more familiar to us, now there was a Bering Sea explosion of about 170 kilotons, which was re registered, and they expect this to be something of the order of 10 meters. This was in 20, uh, this was about two, three years ago. Chelyabinsk was in 2014, in February 2014, uh, that asteroid that exploded above uh, a Russian town and created quite a lot of damage. That was estimated to be around 20 meters. And then the Tunguska event in 1908, which flattened a, a whole forest, uh, and that was significantly larger in the 40, 50 meter category. And as you can see, this is roughly a ballpark of being one every 100 years. So how can we validate this? Well, you need data, as usual. So uh, the U.S. government sensors give us a hand here because this plot shows us the cumulative events which were registered in the atmosphere or on the ground for the past 30 years, so from 1988 to 2019. That means the cumulative, we can put that here and expect to see uh, one event of the order of uh, sort of these big explosions. And in fact, we have the Chelyabinsk event here. And then as we go down in energy, so about... 10 kilotons here, we expect to see a few of these. And in fact, we've got about 10 or 15 of these orange dots and then hundreds of blue ones as we go into smaller. So this is kind of validating this expectation. So that's good. So now 
how many asteroids have been discovered by survey? You've probably already seen this plot in a previous talk, and it shows you that every year with more surveys, such as linear, Catalina, pan stars, we detect more and more, and with LSST, uh, we'll discover more objects. Thousands every year. Now, if we focus on the larger ones, though, uh, you can see that for one kilometer and larger near-Earth asteroids, most of these were discovered with the first big survey, and Catalina contributed substantially to detect a few more. Uh, but these numbers are now in the unity every year, so it's very rare to detect one kilometer size objects uh, anymore, because these have mostly all been discovered. So it looks like one of our questions at the beginning has been answered. And by the way, these plots come from uh, the CNEOS JPL NASA Gov website uh, and are curated by Alan Chamberlain. And these are excellent plots. You can go on the website and find uh, and generate your own plots, which are more up to date. Uh, now, if we go to 140 meters, so a lower size, uh, you can see how this was the previous plot. Now we've got many more, many, many more objects which are being discovered. And this is not decreasing per year. This is just because the survey was not completed this year. This is an older plot. So these objects are still being discovered plenty, and they're still pretty dangerous objects. So this shows the need for more monitoring programs, in a sense. Now, if we go to even smaller objects, you see that there is now a humongous amount of objects gets discovered every year, and, and, and uh, we're now in the tens of thousands cumulative. So if we go back to our initial distribution, you can see how this is almost complete when it comes to large objects. So we've discovered most of them, maybe not entirely all of them, most of them, at least the ones we expect. And as you go into smaller objects, so below 400 meters, they're still room for discovery and these can be still objects which can produce a substantial amount of damage as you've seen so uh, there's plenty plenty to do here um, but let's take uh, so as we relax on these assumptions let's take an example uh, let's take a look at see what happened last year so this is a plot we put together and we looked at all the close approaches so regardless we looked at all the asteroids which came within 20 lunar distances from the earth and decided to plot these asteroid sizes on the y-axis versus the time of their discovery. So from the name of the asteroids, you can work out what year they were discovered in, what time of the year they were discovered in, and put that in reverse days from now. And as you can see, the majority of the large asteroids are, were discovered a long time ago, more than say 10, 15, 20 years ago, because being larger, they're easier to find. And the majority, the vast majority of the objects which have been discovered recently in the last year are all relatively smaller, below 100, meter, uh, below 100 meters in diameter. However, you can see that 2019 UO, which was discovered uh, about three months before the end of the year, um, on the 10th of January 2020 passed us by at 11.8 lunar distances, which cosmologically speaking is not, uh, astronomically speaking, is not a very large distance. Uh, and this is uh, about 300 plus meters in size. Oh, and we've got more than another 10 of these objects, which are bigger than 100 meters, which came also in, in, uh, in short distance uh, from the Earth. So there's not so much to be relaxed about. And, you know, considering that these are all Tunguska-like events or, or worse, then we can consider ourselves lucky so far. Uh, but there's no reason to... Uh, lower our guard in trying to find and, and detect these uh, in time. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've uh, found these questions answered. Well, hello, everybody. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you enjoyed those uh, clips. We have uh, three of the speakers on now um, here to answer your questions. We've had some amazing questions coming through. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the questions. So there was a question from James about how do you estimate the number of asteroids at each size scale? And I think that question is best answered by uh, Marco. Yes, uh, that's an interesting question. It's, uh, it's done in a not so easy and simple way. We basically, every night we discover new asteroids and uh, most of them at first are new because we have a lot of asteroids to discover. After a while, telescopes will start recovering the same asteroids. And uh, the more we find, the more likely it will be to rediscover versus finding new ones. 
And uh, by comparing these two numbers and how they evolve, we get a feeling of how closer we are getting to finding them all and how many we still have left. This is basically the way, this is actually modeled mathematically, but it gives you, us the information on how many are still missing and uh, as a result, how many there are in each size class. Thank you. Um, so a sort of related question. So this impact probability, can you tell us how that's calculated? Okay, yes, there's a lot of mathematics behind this, but basically let's uh, just make it simple. Let's just assume that we have some observations of an asteroid and for these observations, and these observations are compatible with many different possible orbits. They're all gonna be pretty similar, but they're gonna be slightly different depending on how they fit with all the observations. So what we do basically is to see, to compute all these possible orbits that are compatible with the observations we have and then propagate them in the future, extrapolate them into the future and count how many of them actually, when propagated forward, collide with the Earth versus the total. So the ratio, the ratio between how many collide versus the total possible orbit that the asteroid can have are a way to measure the probability that the asteroid could actually collide with the Earth. Then obviously the mathematics is a bit more complex, but this is just a simple hand-waving uh, description of how these probabilities are computed. And again, how do you know how far um, the asteroids are away? How do you calculate their distance? So yes, the distance is also a bit tricky. In most cases, we don't actually measure the distance of the asteroid. We, what we measure is the, basically we compute the size and the orientation of the orbit in the solar system from the observations. And obviously when we can determine the size and how the orbit is placed into the solar system, by knowing where the earth is, we can indirectly determine how far the asteroid is at any given time. In some rare cases for very close and typically very large asteroids, it's also possible to directly measure the distance by using radar, by just bouncing a radio signal to it and receiving the signal back as a normal radar works. And this gives us a direct measurement of the distance of the asteroid at that particular time. Fantastic. So we've you've talked about uh, DART. Um, when was that launched and how effective will it be? How, how big a, uh, an asteroid could it actually move? Okay, it's not launched yet, it will be launched here and it will hit the asteroid two years from now, in 2022. In terms of effectiveness, uh, well, the technique itself uh, is uh, thought to be effective on asteroids ranging from a few hundred meters up to about a kilometer. It depends a little bit on how early you can do it. If you have a few decades to do it before the possible impact and with a suitable large impactor, you can actually deflect it even if it's about order of a kilometer. If you have less time, the same technique will be capable of deflecting a smaller asteroid. The, the main result that will come out of the DART and the AIDA mission is exactly that. It's exactly giving us the scaling law that we can use to estimate how big and how fast an impactor we need for each given size and orbit and warning time so that whenever one comes, we can actually find our impactor properly to be able to deflect it effectively. Thank you so much. Um, I think actually that links in quite nicely to a question for Rami, which is um, about um, this mass. Sorry, I've just missed, lost the question now. Uh, there was a question about the uh, the mass of different asteroids and how do you know um, the mass of an asteroid? How do you predict what it's going to be from the material it's made of? So that's a really, really interesting question. Excellent one, actually. So uh, first of all, we have a pretty good idea of the average composition of the asteroids simply because we've got so many pieces on Earth that we've uh, analyzed tirelessly in our labs. We know exactly what's in these, uh, what's, what's in these rocks. That's one thing. Second part is we can get uh, more or less as well some approximate information of the composition of some asteroid using uh, uh, remote sensing techniques, such as spectroscopy, where we can, through the reflectance of light that's bouncing off these asteroids, we get some 
information about the mineralogy of the surface and we assume that that's also uh, linked to the uh, the bulk composition so uh, using that spectroscopy information plus all the information that we've got from all the rocks on earth gives us a pretty good idea of the uh, of the compositions and once we know the composition we have a pretty good idea as well of the density so if you have uh, a good estimate through imaging of a volume of your asteroid, then you can extrapolate, assuming certain range of densities get a range of masses. So that's how you would do it in a remote sensing way. But if you actually do send a spacecraft, then just through the uh, radio observations and using the instruments on board, you can actually uh, measure how much your orbit, the, the orbit of the spacecraft is gravitationally perturbed and use that to very accurately uh, estimate the mass of the asteroids. So if you are visiting it with a spacecraft, it's, it's a very accurate measurement. Otherwise, we tend to measure the mass of the asteroids based on our uh, idea of what they're made of and their densities. And once we have a good estimate of their size, we can estimate their mass. Thank you. This actually might be a good uh, chance to talk to Francisco because I know Francisco, you mentioned, um, sorry, Rami, you just mentioned that uh, the asteroids we have on, the meteorites we have on Earth. Well, I know Francisco actually has one on him right now, so he can uh, show you that and talk a little bit about uh, this particular asteroid. Well, what I have here is a meteorite, which is about um, uh, half a kilo, actually. It's an iron nickel meteorite that fell in South America a few hundred years ago. And it is. Um, uh, quite dense, I mean, it's the density of iron, which is about eight, I think, eight uh, times uh, more dense than water. And uh, these are very rare, in fact. I mean, they are easier to find because they are, uh, they have magnetic properties and they are very different from any other rocks. But they are uh, uh, less than 10%, I understand, uh, uh, as abundant uh, as the other uh, meteorites are. The rocky meteorites are much more abundant than the iron meteorites. But um, uh, it gives us a very good idea of, uh, of for dating. These are very good. You can date them uh, very accurately. They have, apart from these metals, they have also strontium. They have a uh, 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 ruby strontium uh, um, uh, isotopes. You can measure the ratio of this, which is a kind of, if I could uh, hear a ticking clock, if you imagine that, of these atoms decaying slowly and they have been decaying since the uh, meteorite form uh, four and a half thousand million years ago, more or less. And they are ticking down, ticking down, ticking down. And we can measure the ratios as, as the other moment. And this is how we can the age of these, uh, of these meteorites. It's fascinating. We can hold a piece of rock, a piece of metal, which is a little bit older than the solar system. That's amazing. Thank you, Francisco. Um, so we did have a question uh, from Charlotte about what causes the unusual shape of um, the Ragu and Bennu uh, ast um, asteroids and why, why are they so similar? Um, so, Ram, yeah. answer that? Yes, that's also an interesting question. So there is a, there's a distinctive difference between the asteroids in the asteroid belt and the ones that are very close to Earth, such as Ryugu and Bennu. So Ryugu and, and Bennu are what we call rubble piles. And these are asteroids that have been actually destroyed through collisions. They've disintegrated, particularly due to the, some of the gravitational influences, such as that I've, I've mentioned from Jupiter. So they've actually sort of re-accreted and reformed new bodies again. And because of this, they actually have a lot of four spaces in between. So you can think of them almost like a sponge. And in fact, asteroids like Bennu and uh, Ryugu are thought to have maybe more than 50% pore spaces, empty vacuum spaces were inside of them. Uh, so they've kind of were broken up and then they re-accreted and they sort of re-accrete into a certain spherical shape. Now, because these shapes, these bodies also are very small, they have very low gravity, uh, they tend to rotate and if they rotate quite fast, then the tidal forces from that rotation tend, tends to flatten them out a little bit and maybe create some tidal butt, um, um, some tidal ridges in the equa equatorial parts. And so the effect of the fast rotation that's occurring on these asteroids and the fact that they have 
very low material strength because they were just rubble piles, materials that just accreted together after being completely uh, disintegrated, give them this sort of kind of similar shape because they have been in, in fact shaped by similar processes after being broken up. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, another question for Marco, um, talking about uh, the gravitational effects of other bodies. So as these things are traveling through the solar system, how are other bodies affecting them and how can you account for that? Yeah, another interesting question. In most cases, uh, they don't affect them too much, but all the computations that we do take that into account. So the models that we use, for example, in ESA, we take into account uh, the deflection, the gravitational attraction of all the planets, obviously, and of about 300 major asteroids in the solar system. It doesn't mean that they all actually do something. Most of these small asteroids don't actually affect the trajectory that much, but they're all modeled in the program, as are some other effects, uh, for example, the relativistic effects, for example, the irregularities of the, sh of the shape of the Earth. All of that is known because we know the masses, we know the shapes, we know the positions, and all of that can be taken into account uh, considering the effects, the gravitational attractions of all of these little effects, and uh, using them to model the trajectory of the asteroid. So it's actually a pretty sophisticated model, mathematically and also computationally, as you can imagine. Thank you. Uh, another one for Rami has, has come in about, why is the asteroids, why is the asteroid built where it is in the solar system? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the answer to this is, we had actually bodies everywhere. There's nothing really special about the asteroid belt. You're simply looking at the particular location where small bodies never grew into a planet. So at some point, very early on, as the solar system formed, as I said, uh, you had a lot of bodies that are accreting towards each other, creating very small planetesimals. And if allowed, these planetesimals grew into protoplanets and then planets. So all the small bodies that were in the sort of inner orbits got incorporated into Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. All the larger chunks towards the outside got incorporated into the larger planets. And then for due to Jupiter's influence, as I said, particularly for the asteroid belt, you end up with this, uh, with this area, the, the poor souls who just never had a chance to build a planet. So that's the main reason why the bodies would seem to be concentrated there. When we started off, we had small bodies everywhere in the solar system, but in uh, in, pre in favorable locations, these bodies grew into a planet, whereas in the asteroid belt, they never had that chance. So there's a link question about that, is is how stable is the asteroid belt today? Um, is it a nice stable, or is there is, are there collisions and all sorts of things happening there right now? So, yeah, that's an interesting question as well. So... Dynamically speaking, the asteroid belt is being affected by collisions with, of, uh, with bodies with each other. The influence of Jupiter is actually, with time, kicking a lot of materials out of the, of the asteroid belt. So, in fact, the asteroid belt has already lost a lot of materials since it formed 4.6 billion years ago. Having said that, there are just as there are unstable orbits caused by resonance, you can also get stable, e stable areas. So just given them enough time, even if there are some stable airs in the asteroid belt, we, we might envision that at some point down the line, uh, we may run out of bodies in, this, in the asteroid belt simply due to migrating bodies, due to collisions where they just keep on fragmenting to, uh, to smaller and smaller sizes and the continued influence of Jupiter and, uh, and other bodies uh, that are acting on the asteroid belt. So uh in a sense it's it's kind of dwindling with time but slowly so quite a tricky question here really uh, francisco i'm not sure if you can answer this or not but um, so a new asteroids being formed now because you spoke about the asteroid you had in your hand being you know four over four billion years old are there new ones being formed now do we know That's a, that's a very, very interesting question. I'm, I'm sure that other people are more qualified to answer that. But uh, um, how do you make asteroids? Um, 
they are coalescence of, uh, of material which is loose in that protoplanetary disk, but also they can be formed by collisions, by, by fragmentation when two big objects collide and then you produce a shower of, uh, of uh, smaller objects. We will keep, we could be talking about Saturn, for example, this stuff, but um, I wouldn't say that new asteroids being formed, you can, asteroids that collide and they produce smaller fragments that become um, um, smaller asteroids. I would I would say something like that. I don't know if any of the other colleagues have, could add on or what I just said. I can echo what Francesco said as well. Uh, basically, compositionally speaking, all the asteroids, all the small bodies formed 4.6 billion years ago when the solar system formed, and there's been nothing new being formed. <laughs> But what is happening is that dynamically you can start, you can get new families of asteroids due to migration from the asteroid belt to the near Earth uh, asteroids, fragment, fragmentation of, uh, of a larger asteroid into smaller families. So you might end up with sort of what we call dynamically new uh, bodies. Uh, but as far as composition, compositionally speaking, there are no new asteroids being formed in the solar system. I so that leads me on to another question, which is, uh, Marco, and, and you can join in afterwards. Um, how, if, the, if, if we've got new ones being created and we're discovering new ones all the time, how are we naming them? Um, is there a convention about how we should name these things? So why we still need to discover some, I guess. Well, the thing is, not all of them are easy to discover. There are some that have particularly peculiar orbits that keep them far from the Earth for long, long times, maybe for that. And they only come close enough and they become observable only very rarely, maybe every 20, 30 years or something like that. So we haven't been doing this for a lot. The asteroid survey started basically two decades ago. So there could still be large asteroids that are still out there, been there for forever, but they are in orbits that keep them far enough from the Earth and hidden enough from our telescope that we haven't had a chance to find them yet. But with time, these orbits will move in a way that make them discoverable from Earth, so we will be finding them also. So it's just a question of time and the fact that we haven't been doing this activity for that long. Thank you. Okay, so we have two more questions I'd like answered uh, before we start on the next round of videos. Uh, the next round of clips is talking a lot more about the composition of asteroids. How do we know what they are and how could we potentially utilize them? Um, so some really two very interesting talks coming up. But talking about the composition of asteroids, does uh, the composition have a big effect on uh, the how damaging uh, an asteroid will be if it hits the Earth? I think that's probably a good question for Marco. Yeah, it depends, uh, obviously, on the size. Uh, I've given some examples in my talk. Basically, they go from nearly no damage at all, let's say in the few meters size range, to obviously major damage. That is like the, the absolute extreme would be that the asteroids destroyed the, the dinosaurs and uh, all these species that were alive at the time on Earth, a lot of species that were alive at that time. So I guess it, it depends mostly on the size one could sort of estimate from size and velocity of encounter the, the kind of damage, but a lot of things depend on subtle details, for example, where it hits uh, the kind of rocky material, the substrate on the earth, or maybe if it hits on the ocean. Uh, some of it may also depend on the, the entry angle. Things that fall down vertically may have different way of dissipating its en the energy and then things that come shallowly through the atmosphere. So it's, it's a complex uh, scenario. A lot of ingredients go into it. Some maybe others to predict, for example, everything that has to do with the interaction of the asteroid with the atmosphere and uh, the friction of the asteroid to the atmosphere and the thermal properties, that thermal phenomena that happen, that is tricky to model. But in general, the main dominant thing is the size and the mass. So that gives us a general idea. Let's say that anything that is kilometers is going to cause some very global event on Earth, very global uh, catastrophe. Anything that is in the hundreds of meters may cause damage, let's say, regionally at like country level or continent level. 
everything that is in the tens of meters is probably going to cause effects that are localized to a few tens of kilometers around the point of impact. And everything less than 10 meters is going to be minor damage or nothing at all, depending on what's under it. So just to give you an, a rough idea of uh, the different size ranges and what they can do. Thank you. So the last question, it sort of links into composition a little bit. Uh, Rami, I don't know if you'd like to talk about a little bit about the Kuiper belt um, and these, these other objects that are further outside um, of our solar system. So uh, is that reference to the question on uh, the size of the asteroid? Size, but also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a very interesting question. So asteroids, we, we would measure this, the shape and size simply by directly imaging them if they're close enough. In the case of the Kuiper belt, what we actually even did with the target of the New Horizons mission is we utilized an astronom astronomical technique called stellar occultations. And what we do actually is we wait for that body to go in front of a star and we are measuring the brightness coming out of that star before that body passes in front of it. And then as the body passes in front, we measure how much of the light, how less of a light we receive from that star. Because in a sense, that body, because it's coming between us and the star, sort of like eclipse parts, it, it, it eclipse part of it. So they're, 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 they're become, have what happens is a decrease of the light coming from the star. And the amount of light that is decreased allows us to actually have a pretty good estimate not just about the size of the body, but if we have more accurate measurements, even the shape. So that's generally speaking how we uh, uh, derive the size of very far away bodies. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everyone at home has um, uh, been very thankful for your the questions. Please do keep the questions coming in. Uh, we've got uh, two more speakers coming up and then another Q&A session. So please go on to Slido, uh, the Talking Asteroids event code, and you can get your own questions answered um, by our panelists. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my job is to tell you about meteorites, which have already been mentioned by the previous speakers. And I'm going to try to show you what meteorites can tell us about the asteroids. So we've already heard a little bit of what meteorites actually are. They're mostly leftover pieces of the solar system, uh, that were the early solar system that was formed about four and a half billion years ago. And you can see here several very large and well-known asteroids, uh, meteorites, the Hoba meteorite in Namibia, the El Chaco meteorite here. Uh, both of these are uh, metal iron meteorites and the larger ones tend to be metal uh, and then the smaller ones tend to be either um, metal and silicate metal and olivine in this case this this beautiful yellow colored mineral here is olivine the rest of this is metal or completely composed of the silicate minerals the rocky minerals so you've already heard where meteorites come from. They come from asteroids. They come from asteroids that are in the asteroid belt. I say mostly because there are some asteroids, so, sorry, there are some meteorites that come from uh, other planets like Mars and the Moon. But meteorites in the asteroid belt uh, were ejected from the asteroid belt either by collision with other asteroids or by the gravitational effect of Jupiter. And then they are disturbed in their orbit and they move into the inner part of the solar system where they become uh, near Earth objects. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. So just to remind you again of the uh, nature of the inner part of the solar system, uh, we have the sun at the center and uh, the rocky planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And then the main part of the asteroid belt is shown here in, in uh, white between Mars and Jupiter. And this is an, an image that we never see because we're looking down on the solar system 
uh, from above the North Pole of the Sun. So this is what I like to think of as an alien's eye view of the solar system. However, we don't just have um, the main asteroid belt, as has already been mentioned, we have near-Earth objects. And the near-Earth objects are very well known now because we are aware of the threat of impact that was talked about earlier. So this image is a, a close-up of the solar system, uh, the sun in the middle, and then I have highlighted Earth in red and Mars in blue. Uh, all the red dots inside the um, orbits of uh, Mars and Earth, those are the near-Earth objects. And the green dots, of which there are far, many, far more, um, are the asteroids in the inner part of the main asteroid belt. Now, how can we be sure that uh, we know that meteorites come from the asteroid belt? Well, we track them. And this is a diagram showing, again, the, uh, the red ellipse is the Earth's orbit, the blue ellipse is Mars's orbit. We're looking down on the Sun, which isn't marked. And the black ellipses, these black ellipses like this one here with names on them, including Tagish Lake, uh, those are the orbits of some recent meteorites. And you can see that. Um, at the point that they are furthest from the Sun, they are most definitely in the um, asteroid belt. Now we've already heard a little bit about this asteroid. The first Earth colliding asteroid that was actually detected before impact was 2008 TC3. It was detected by the Catalina Sky Survey. It broke up in the atmosphere. We have pictures of its uh, vapor trail. Uh, it landed in Sudan. And fortunately, the resulting meteorites were collected by um, U US and Sudanese scientists who went out into the desert and found about 600 meteorites. I'll come back to this um, particular asteroid later, I hope. So there's a traditional classification of meteorites, and the traditional classification is based on what they're made of. So we have the iron nickel meteorites. They have almost no uh, silicate minerals in them. And they probably come from the core of a uh, differentiated asteroid. So there's also, a, a rarer group of stony iron meteorites. And these contain, as, as I showed at the beginning, this lovely orange uh, crystals of olivine, and they are embedded in iron. And then we have the slightly less spectacular, but equally interesting scientifically, uh, stony meteorites. And these are comp composed entirely of uh, silicate minerals. And one of the meteorites that I find, one kind of meteorite that I find absolutely fascinating uh, is this rock, type of rock here, which is called a breccia. And you can see that it's made of lots of tiny pieces that have got different colors to them. And this isn't just uh, an optical illusion, they are indeed different bits of rock. So if you like a bargain, you go for the breccias because in one piece of rock, one meteorite, you can have hundreds of different ty rock types. Now, another way that we can relate asteroids to meteorites is using the spectral type. And the spectral type is, in fact, the reflectance of the asteroid at uh, different wavelengths. And wavelength is on the uh, horizontal axis here and uh, reflectance up the vertical axis. And we can see there's a set of uh, triangles right at the top here, which are the um, observation of an S-type asteroid. And then offset, so that it's easier to see, we have the spectrum of an S-type meteorite. Same with the two in the bottom section of this diagram, we have a V-type asteroid in the triangles and a V-type meteorite 
uh, in the circles. Now, before you start writing in and asking questions, well, why are they actually different? The reason is that we have a thing called space weathering. And space weathering affects asteroids because they are airless bodies, they have no atmosphere, uh, they're directly uh, open to the space environment and we get huge amounts of uh, solar wind and even galactic cosmic rays impacting on the surface and this, that can change the actual uh, reflectance of the asteroid. So we do have to take this space weathering into account but when we've done that uh, down here in the table there's a set of classes of asteroids C, S, M, B and V um, and those actually are related to what we think the asteroid is made of. So S is a silicious asteroid and M is a metallic asteroid. And then there's an example in the third column of what kind of asteroid we might be looking at. Um, and then in the fourth column where it says probable meteorite type, this is our best guess as to which kind of meteorites come from which asteroid families. And you can see about halfway down uh, that in the metallic uh, asteroids, the M class of which Psyche is um, a very good example, we have an equivalent of the ions and stony iron meteorites that I already introduced you to. And here they are again, the stony iron and iron meteorites. And we think that they came from the core and close to the core mantle boundary of a small differentiated asteroid, an asteroid that was warm enough, hot enough to start to melt and to uh, become layered inside. And so just like the Earth, we think asteroid 4 Vesta has a core which is composed of metal, a mantle that is composed largely of olivine, that lovely orange mineral that you can see there on the uh, left, the bottom left, and it has a thick crust as well. And we get a number of our meteorites come from the surface of the planet Vesta. Now, Vesta is a differentiated asteroid. In fact, it may be the only remaining differentiated asteroid because possibly all the others have broken up in some way. And the, our reason for saying that is that we have hundreds of different types of iron meteorite. So although you can put some of those together chemically and they look like they've come from the same parent asteroid, there are still over a hundred that are not related to any other metal meteorite. So we might have hundreds, if not thousands of uh, metal asteroids out there, which are the remnants of the core um, of previously differentiated little bodies. Now, one of the um, ways in which we study meteorites is to take them to our electron microscope. And this is a picture of a couple of stony meteorites, uh, or the same stony meteorite, but shown in two different ways. Now, stony meteorites are often left over from, uh, from parent asteroids that did not do this melting thing. They were not differentiated. They're left over after planet formation. They were never involved in forming any kind of planet. or They did form asteroids, but they're quite late in accreting. And, and one of the interesting features about these stony meteorites is that they contain uh, these little spheres here are what we call chondrules. So the picture on the left is called a backscattered X-ray image, and it is used to uh, for us to look at the detailed internal structure of a meteorite. On the right is what we call a false colour image, where uh, we look at the X-rays that come off this uh, meteorite when we bombard it with electrons, and uh, we see uh, that the, the X-rays for the element magnesium we colour in in red and for the element iron we colour in green and for the element sulphur in this case we colour it in blue and you can immediately see that there's a bit of iron here because it's bright green and you can see these uh, magnesium chondrules uh, are uh, full of uh, they're bright red so they're full of magnesium and the blue is uh, sulphide mineral. 
Now I'm going to try to explain how chondrules are formed um, because they are one of the most abundant items that we find in meteorites. We have a class of meteorite called ordinary chondrites and they are usually chock full of chondrules. So chondrules are tiny spheres of melted rock and on the left hand side we have some microscope images of them. So these are just when you, you cut the meteorite into a very thin slice and you shine light through it and you can see on an, on an ordinary microscope uh, what they look like. And there's lots of information that a trained person can take out of these, these pictures. But how did they form? Well, the one thing that we do know is that they must have had uh, a period of time when they were very hot and they melted because they often contain glass and glass is what happens to melted rock when it freezes again instead of crystallizing as crystals it often forms glass and there's an old traditional if you like uh, way of uh, explaining how, how um, chondrules are formed and it uh, involves the accretion uh, this is in the top diagram with all the pretty colors uh, accretion of metal and olivine and this material was then heated up and when you heat up metal and the olivine together uh, you can start to melt and this is where we get the pale blue cyan kind of color which is the melt itself so um, how they were heated is um, still under debate but maybe they were heated by shock waves from the, uh, the sun and slowly they become bigger and they uh, accrete other things they form rims as you can see on the left on the right hand side so that's the traditional method of forming chondrules at least the traditional hypothesis um, science works in interesting ways um, people have thought ever since the first person who looked at a meteorite with chondrules in it down a microscope which was about 150 years ago the very first person said oh these looks like drops of fiery rain and we still have that basic idea that these were droplets spherical droplets in our in space that um, were formed by melting however we've more recently we've come up with a, a new idea and that is this alternative idea shown at the bottom right hand corner where we have impact splashes. Now what this means is that you have two bodies, two planetesimals, two asteroids that collide and they are sufficiently hot or the collision is sufficiently uh, energetic that lots of melt is formed. And that may be one way in which um, chondrules are formed because those impact splashes will also be spherical uh, they may crystallize and they may also form glass. So that's um, a, a new way to form chondrules. And at the moment, it's a subject of lively debate. Going back to asteroids, if you look at the density of asteroids, and that's shown on the bottom here, the horizontal axis, where it says density in those lovely old units of grams per cubic centimeter, uh, you can see on the right hand side I've written the word intact and that's where the density is around three grams per cubic centimeter and that's the typical density of uh, rocks and uh, a mixture of rock and metal and you'll see at the top right hand corner there we go um, Vesta and Vesta is one of the largest of the asteroids and it's also one of the densest so we can make a, a prediction there that we that Vesta is intact it is not uh, a broken up asteroid but as we go over to the other side where the density is very low uh, and we find a lot of asteroids here like Sylvia and Psyche um, Yes, these have got a low density. And we think that they are basically broken up pieces that have re uh, of the same asteroid that has reaccreted into what we call a rubble pile. Before you start writing in saying Phobos and Deimos down here are not asteroids, I bet you they are. Uh, they just happen to be have been captured by um, Mars. So those are the two uh, moons of Mars. Okay, so one of the things that I like to do is studying these brecciated meteorites. 
And why do I like that? Because they tell us what's happening on the very surface of asteroids. So we've seen things that happen in the core, and now we're looking at things that happen on the very surface. And on the left-hand side, we have a rather weathered looking meteorite, and that's because it's been sitting out in the desert for a long time. But you can see it's all made of the same stuff, and in between the blocks of this orange colored rock, you can see some black lines. Now these are black veins, they go all the way through the rock, they are actually the uh, uh, result of melting due to impact, melting of the silicate rock due to impact, and then they freeze, and then this all happens on an asteroid, it's nothing to do with what happens when the asteroid, the, the meteorite arrives on Earth. Um, so it's telling us a bit about asteroids. And now on the right hand side, this is the only meteorite I'm going to show you that isn't from an asteroid. This one's from the moon. Um, and it contains a lot of different types of lunar rocks. So if you can't afford um, a big individual meteorite from the moon because it's so expensive to buy one from meteorite collectors, you might look at a brecciated meteorite because it's got all the bits of the surface of the moon in it. Um, and you, it doesn't take uh, you to be much of a uh, geologist to say, well, that dark colored gray, dark gray, and that light gray might be different, that lump. And that's different from this lump that seems to be made of a very brown and, and white material. And then there's another brown and white material clump, lump here. And therefore you can get a lot of in useful information out of a single piece of a brecciated meteorite. Now let's have a look at the surface of a real asteroid. This is Bennu, you've heard about Bennu, and uh, these are images from NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. They only came back a few days ago, so they're quite up to date. Um, look at the scale. In some places, we're looking at things that are less than half a meter ac across, a little white box is less than half a meter across. And uh, the NASA uh, scientists have actually put on some little yellow lines here, little arrows that are pointing to where the surface rocks have been fractured. So I think it comes as no surprise, although I couldn't show it on the previous couple of diagrams, that Bennu looks like a very fractured asteroid. It's a rubble pile. So, so far, we've only managed to visit one asteroid and bring a, bring a bit of rock back to Earth. This was done by the Japanese. They visited the asteroid Itokawa, and their Hayabusa mission touched down on the surface of the, this S-type asteroid. As you can see in the top left-hand corner where we have an, uh, an artist's impression. And Hayabusa means falcon. And it basically was swooping down over the surface of the asteroid and grabbed a sample. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't grab a very big sample, but the Japanese scientists didn't worry too much about that because they got enough for them to do a lot of science. So up in the middle, uh, this grey image in the middle um, is a uh, particle from Itakawa. This is a, uh, an electron microscope image again. And once again, we can see the mineral olivine. So we know that there's lots of olivine on asteroid Itakawa. And in fact, they were able to do this other thing with a, an electron microprobe, in which in the bottom right hand corner, um, they've shown us the uh, olivine composition, and it's just described as the amount of Fa in the olivine, so we don't, don't need to worry about what that means. And you can see from the histogram uh, that almost all of the particles that they've analysed fall in a field called LL. There's also a field called L and a field called H, and these are the ordinary chondrite fields. So now we know that Itakawa asteroid is the same as LL, uh, ordinary chondrite meteorites. So where next with asteroids and meteorites? Well, uh, as has already been mentioned, um, Japanese uh, probe Hayabusa 2 is already on its way, bringing pieces of the very dark asteroid Ryugu back to Earth. And we're wondering whether it will look like the carbon-rich meteorites which we have in our collections.
Um, NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission is bringing back pieces of a B-type asteroid, uh, asteroid Bennu. This is another carbon-rich asteroid, and we don't know whether it'd be the same as Ryugu or different. We'll have to wait and see. We know, however, that there are several kinds of carbon-rich meteorites, and so um, bets are on for what kinds we will find on Ryugu and Bennu. And of course, we might actually find something that is not in our meteorite collection. I think that's very, very um, exciting. And in fact, going back to the asteroid 2008 TC3, in that material that fell to Earth as meteorites, we have already found uh, several kinds of meteorites that were not in our um, terrestrial meteorite collection. So we already have found some new meteorites from an asteroid impacting the Earth. So the, uh, the last thing I want to mention is the mission to asteroid 16 Psyche. Now this will be the first to visit a metal asteroid. Psyche is an M-type asteroid. But this is unfortunately not a sample return mission. Um, but it will investigate Psyche very closely. It will try to make um, analyses of the surface. And we're hoping that we will find that Psyche looks like some of our iron meteorites. I've shown one here on the bottom, which has been cut and etched. You can see inside it's, it's much more complicated than it looks on the outside with several different kinds of crystals in there. Now, for those of you who are interested in the, uh, the, the possibility of asteroid mining, it has been estimated, not by me, but uh, by uh, economists, that Psyche might contain 700 million billion dollars worth of gold and precious metals. And on that, I think I'll hand over to the next speaker who's going to tell us about um, what precious materials we can bring or we can mine on asteroids and, uh, and the moon. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here as part of International Asteroid Day. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about, there's been a lot of speculation recently about whether we could use asteroids for resources to uh, build things in space, or maybe, as Hillary alluded to, even mine things on asteroids that would be very valuable to return to the Earth. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about lunar resources, because I think if we're going to talk about space resources, then we should be talking about um, both the moon and, and asteroids. So I just wanted to um, say something about the economics of space resources, and they're kind of summarized on this, uh, on this graph, which shows how much energy it takes to get from the surface of the Earth. I assume you can see my pointer. The x-axis here is distance from the center of the Earth. So this is the center of the Earth here, and the Earth's surface is there. And then this is the energy, this massive hill you have to climb in order to get off the Earth to a low Earth orbit, a geostationary orbit, or largely out of the Earth's gravity well to get to the Moon. And then I hope you can see the Moon here. The Moon has its own gravity well, of course, but it's much less deep than the Earth's. Um, so this is the energy you need to get something off the surface of the Moon into cislunar space or Earth or Earth-Moon Earth system space. If we wish to do um, things in space that require us to build things in space, it's going to be a lot cheaper to source those materials or that energy in space itself rather than launching it from the surface of the Earth. Because if you wanted to do something in geostationary orbit, for example, to launch all that material you need from the Earth, you've got to climb this massive uh, hill. Whereas if you mined it from the Moon, you've got a little hill to climb and then it's actually downhill. If you mind it from asteroids, the asteroids are further away, of course, so even the nearest ones. So um, you, they'd be on this blue line, but several slides to the, to the right. Um, but essentially, you, you, if you wanted to mine things on asteroids to use in space, then you've got negligible gravity that you'd have to lift those materials out of. So this is, the, um, this is the primary economic reason for wanting to mine asteroids. So there's a hierarchy of possibilities that you might want to use space resources for, and they're, um, they're uh, listed in this box. So the first thing you might want to do is to, if we're exploring the moon, uh, uh, or Mars, or, or even asteroids, and we need materials to uh, facilitate that exploration, 
then it's going to be clearly cheaper to source those materials locally than it would be to lift these materials all the way from the, up this massive mountain all the way into space. And this is called in situ resource utilization, the utilization of space resources in situ to facilitate um, scientific or exploration activities. Um, we could build on that, and this is a second bullet point. If we wish to build really large scale infrastructures in space, um, or develop a space economy that would facilitate uh, um, communications infrastructures in, in near Earth space, scientific infrastructures, energy infrastructures, tourism even. All of these activities are going to be much um, uh, economically more viable if they utilize resources that have been sourced in space rather than lifted from the surface of the Earth. And then finally, as Hillary alluded to at the end of her talk, we might find some things in space that are so valuable that actually it would be economic to go into space and mine those uh, resources in space and then import them uh, directly into the uh, into the world economy. There aren't many of those things, I think, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what ideas have been suggested. So I do want to stress the scientific value of using space resources, uh, potentially. Many scientists are quite um, aghast is the wrong word, but sceptical uh, when it comes to talking about space resources because it seems very, you know, commercial. There are all these horrible commercial companies and they're just trying to make money and science is supposed to be purer than that. Um, on the other hand, science does require a lot of expensive stuff. And, and as we explore the universe, we may wish to build quite a lot of big expensive stuff in space. So here are some examples. Picture on top uh, right shows the Darwin interferometer. So this was a proposed European Space Agency um, interferometer to study um, planets around nearby stars. And it's several space telescopes. Uh, all have to be in space, built in space or be cheaper. If they, the point is they'd be cheaper if you had to build these large telescopes in space. We might imagine telescopes on the moon, the lunar observatory. We might imagine a lunar outpost, which would be like a bit like an Antarctic research station on the moon, that would facilitate a fantastic amount of exploration uh, of the moon, but it's going to be economically much more um, realistic if it's, many of its resources are sourced on the moon than carted from the Earth. And here's a slide from uh, the, the film The Martian with Matt Damon carrying something to his big pressurised vehicle. I mean, in the fullness of time, the exploration of Mars would also um, benefit greatly from an in-situ scientific research infrastructure, again, a bit like an Antarctic research station. But these things are probably only going to be feasible if we um, utilize as many in, in situ space resources as we can. Uh, just to seed a thought in your minds, I mean, there might be a, even a long-term environmental case for utilizing space resources rather than, rather than continuing to mine some of these resources from the surface of the earth. So the big picture here shows what I think is a bauxite mine. I think it's in Australia. The big digger is encroaching on the forest behind. Um, now, one of the reasons that um, mining things on the earth is detrimental is we're destroying habitats of um, creatures, animals that we plant, that we share this planet with, but, but of course don't, they don't benefit from our activities. Our activities are wholly destructive from their point of view. Um, whereas if we could move some of this activity to places that don't have indigenous life forms of their own, like the moon, <laughs> so here's a picture of something similar going on on the surface of the moon in bottom left, um, uh, we could, uh, our industrial activities would not impinge so much on the other inhabitants of, um, uh, of planet Earth. So this could be a long-term environmental case. So it's not just an economic case. There, there could be, in the longer term, an environmental case for utilising space resources rather than, um, than terrestrial ones. I mean, put it this way, can, uh, from an environmental point of view, it has to be preferable, I assume, to strip mine the moon or to strip mine an asteroid than to strip mine the Amazon rainforest. I mean, the, the, the difference in harm between those two possibilities seems obvious. Um, but of course, this isn't an option we have at the moment. We don't have a space infrastructure that, that's able to mine the moon or asteroids yet. And until we develop such an infrastructure, then this isn't, a, this isn't an option that we'll ever have in front of us. So it's possi possibly one up one reason for developing a, a space economy to give us this option in the longer term. Um, anyway, so asteroid resources first. 
So um, previous speakers have already told us a lot about the geography of the solar system. So uh, everyone will be aware that most asteroids occupy the so-called main belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Um, but from a resource, space resources point of view, it's the near Earth asteroids that are easier to access. Um, and so at least initially would be the focus of a future space resource industry. Uh, there are a lot of them. There are more than 20,000 known near-Earth asteroids over 100 metres in size. There'll be many millions of smaller ones currently mostly uncatalogued, but as Marco pointed out, they will become catalogued given our very sophisticated and sensitive telescopes that we now have. Um, of the near-Earth asteroid population, then we've got, from a resource point of view, I think we'd probably be most interested in the carbonaceous asteroids like um, like Bennu or Ryugu that Hillary and Rami have both mentioned. Um, and these comprise perhaps 10 to 15 percent of the near-Earth asteroid population and they're of interest primarily because they're volatile rich. The, the, the most volatile rich ones, perhaps 10 or 20 percent by mass uh, H2O. Um, and then the, as Hillary also mentioned, the metallic asteroids, I mean these are much rarer in the near-Earth asteroid population uh, but they're still a few percent of asteroids, so that's still quite a lot of asteroids. And they, as Hillary pointed out, they're mostly pure um, iron and nickel with some significant cobalt and then some uh, platinum group elements, which may be of interest. And here's a picture that both Hillary and Remy showed of asteroid Bennu currently visiting, being visited by the NASA Osiris Rex mission. So we're going to learn a lot more about these asteroids from missions like Osiris Rex. So Hillary's um, talked already about the composition of, um, of meteorites and we infer from the spectral types and similar spectral similarities between asteroids and meteorites that we think we can guess what particular types of meteorites have come from which particular types of asteroids. So here is a hand specimen of a, an iron meteorite. Hillary shared a similar picture. You can see the crisscrossing pattern. This is the Wittmann-Staten pattern of intergrown acamasite and taenite iron nickel crystals that you get in iron meteorites. Uh, and so iron asteroids like 16 Psyche are probably similar um, and if they are then they'd be mostly so in this case in almost 90% iron and 10% nickel and half a percent cobalt but then you've got all of these other so-called segraphile elements that chemically partition with iron, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium etc, iridium, platinum, gold uh, these are there in sort of tens of parts per million quantities by mass. So they're not, you know, hugely common, but they are about as rich as you can find in a natural resource because nature has already um, refined these and concentrated them to go with the iron in the, in the, in the, iron, ast the iron nickel asteroid. So Hillary alluded to, to this in her slide. If you currently, uh, present prices, I mean, prices of these materials fluctuate, of course, but they're in the range of like to tens of thousands of dollars per kilogram for most of these elements, which means that a pretty modest iron asteroid, I mean, something much smaller than 16 Psyche, a 200 meter diameter iron asteroid would be worth $100 billion um, at present prices, just looking at the platinum group metals that it contains. Um, now, of course, there's a big caveat here, though. This, this has caused some of the would-be asteroid miners to get very excited because they think they can make a fantastic fortune mining these asteroids. But of course, um, if you were to suddenly import all these precious metals to the Earth, then the market in them will collapse or the price will collapse because the supply will have been increased. So it's not obvious if you start mining asteroids that these, these very useful materials will still be <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars per kilogram. So I, the would-be asteroid miners, I hope, have a more sophisticated economic pricing model for this. Um, but actually, I'm a bit sceptical that uh, importing these materials is ever going to be that economic, importing them directly to the Earth. Um, whereas, of course, for building things in space, um, it's not so much the platinum, platinum group metals that will be of value, but uh, the iron, the nickel, and perhaps the cobalt will be very useful if you're building things in space, regardless of whether you wish also to import the platinum group metals that you may have uh, refined uh, to the Earth. For use in space, I think the carbonaceous, uh, carbonaceous asteroids are probably going to be much more valuable, at least in the near term. 
say picture at top left shows the Natural History Museum's sample of the Avuna carbonaceous meteorite, CI meteorite, but the CIs are the most volatile rich meteorites and the I stands for Avuna, so that's like the type specimen of these um, uh, uh, meteorites. So the CM chondrites are similarly but not quite as volatile uh, rich. But th these two these two asteroid meteorite classes, they're very volatile rich, so 10 to 20 percent water. Um, carbon rich, several percent carbon, and relatively uh, by, by the standards of many rocks in space, nitrogen rich, so 0.1 to 0.3 percent nitrogen. Um, nitrogen, for reasons I'll come to in a minute, could be quite a useful material in space. Uh, quite a useful element. So if we then consider a 500 meter diameter carbonaceous asteroid like Bennu and we take the lower limits of these percentage compositions, this is why I've got greater than here, 7 million tonnes of water, 1.4 million tonnes of carbon, 70,000 tonnes of nitrogen contained in such a object. Now water will obviously be valuable as a space resource. Um, in, in context of human exploration, of course, people will need water to survive, but water is also easily, um, provided you've got an energy source, splittable into hydrogen and oxygen. People also need oxygen to breathe. Hydrogen and oxygen in combination is a very useful rocket fuel. So, so water is a, um, a very, would be a very useful substance to have. And bear in mind that, um, uh, if I go back to this, this slide, bearing in mind that a cubic metre of water weighs a tonne, if you want that water and the hydrogen and oxygen it contains to be doing things up here in space, you really don't want to be lifting it up this massive energy well. You really need to source it in space. And the carbonaceous um, uh, asteroids will be ideal for that. Carbon and nitrogen, I mean, if we're going to be serious about doing things in space on a large scale, then at some point food is going to have to be grown in space. So local sources of carbon and nitrogen would be important as well as water in order to do that. And of course it's all very well to say that uh, we need oxygen to breathe, but actually humans can only breathe oxygen you know, at a partial pressure of about 0.2 of a bar. So we need a buffer gas to mix with our oxygen um, in our moon bases and Mars bases and on the Earth that gas is nitrogen. So in the space environment it might be beneficial if it was nitrogen as well. But this requires a, a, an in-space source of nitrogen and again the uh, carbonaceous asteroids might um, uh, be a, a source for that. So I now want to say something a little bit about asteroids on the moon. Um, uh, so a picture on the left shows the moon orbiting the Earth that was taken by the Galileo spacecraft on its way to Jupiter in the mid-1990s. picture on the right shows a large lunar far side crater, that's Daedalus crater. Uh, but anyway, the point is the moon is covered in craters, so this means the moon has been hit by a lot of asteroids in the past. So potentially, uh, if, not all, if, not, if not all the asteroid material is vaporised on impact, then there may be fragments of asteroids on the moon. If there were, then going to the moon to find fragments of asteroids from a resource point of view might be easier than going to the asteroids to find the asteroids because the moon is much closer to the earth, it's uniformly close to the earth, it doesn't, so the distance from the earth to the moon doesn't change in the way that it does for between the earth and any given asteroid. Um, so in fact, finding, looking for asteroidal resources on the um, moon might actually be easier than looking for asteroidal resources um, uh, in the near Earth, in, in, the, in the region of the near Earth asteroids. Um, so uh, how might we find them? So metallic asteroids, there's already a, um, an argument that many of the magnetic anomalies that have been discovered on the moon, this is a lunar magnetic anomaly map, the high colours show the uh, places where lunar magnetic anomalies occur. This is the far side on the left and the near side on the right. Uh, this is the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is a large impact structure on the far side of the moon near the lunar South Pole. Anyway, so um, metallic asteroids will have, have leave a magnetic signature and we might locate them on the moon through flying a uh, magnetometers to detect um, their magnetic fields and signatures. So if we were to visit these localities, 
we'd find hopefully an iron meteorite, and but entrained in it would be the nickel, the cobalt, and the platinum group metals. If we're going to start searching the moon for crashed asteroids, though, we might also, if we're going to be operating on the moon looking for crashed asteroids, we might as well also be looking for the moon's indigenous resources in addition. And the moon has a lot of those. So this image kind of shows the mineralogy of the moon. The near side is on the left the uh, far side on the right. Uh, basically the high titanium mare basalts are coloured in red so if you were after iron, titanium, magnesium, silicon and oxygen you'd go to the red bits. The yellow areas are the low titanium mare basalts so this is where you'd go if you're interested in iron, magnesium, silicon and oxygen. And the blue bits are the anorthrocytic lunar highland crust which don't contain iron, magnesium or titanium but are very rich in calcium and aluminium which are also useful materials especially aluminium uh, and silicon and oxygen. So the moon has its own mineral, mineral resources, the moon has its own volatile resources and this beautiful picture taken by Japanese Kaguya spacecraft few years ago, decade ago now, looking over the flying over the far side of the moon. So, uh, large craters, this is the crater Shackleton here, the lunar south pole, it's a 20 kilometer diameter impact crater. And the point about craters at the lunar poles is the sun is always on the horizon at the lunar poles, which means the crate interiors of craters are always dark, they're always cold, perhaps about uh, 40 Kelvin or even less. And in such cold, permanently shadowed regions, water is stable as an ice. And there is now very strong evidence that water ice exists in these polar craters. So this would mean the moon, in addition to whatever crashed carbonaceous asteroids it may retain, the moon will also have its own sources of water in, um, in permanent shadowed craters at the lunar poles. Um, the moon, because it's a large active planetary sized, small but planetary sized body, has its own internal geological processes which have refined other chemical elements. Na nature has concentrated through, through geological processes other possibly useful materials that generally aren't concentrated in asteroids. And the rare earth elements, so that's the group in the periodic table from um, lanthanum to lutetium. Um, Cetrium, scandium, but anyway, in the rare earth elements in the periodic table, these are these are very. They're not all that rare on the Earth, but they are extremely useful because they've got a wide range of um, catalytic and electrical, magnetic, chemical properties. Everybody's smartphones and computers rely on these rare earth elements, uh, and the Moon does has had geological processes which have concentrated them. And on the near side of the Moon. It's highlighted in these colored, this coloured area here to the western part of the near side of the moon, sort of around the Imbrium impact basin, uh, so-called the Prosolarum Creek terrain, which nature has uh, concentrated these materials. So if we're going to be operating on the moon looking for material, raw materials, we could be looking for crashed asteroids, but in addition we could be looking for materials that the moon has concentrated on its own, like the polar ices, and rare earth elements and may well be other, other minerals. I just want to do a quick comparison now between lunar resources and asteroidal resources. So considering the asteroidal resources first, the image there shows the main belt asteroid Gaspera, so that is a main belt asteroid and quite big, 16 kilometers long, um, just there to illustrate. But anyway, um, uh, the advantages of asteroidal sourcing raw materials from asteroids is there uh, asteroids themselves are small, they therefore have negligible gravities. In terms of energy to get there and back, some of them are easier to access than the lunar surface because their own surface gravities are so low. On the other hand, unlike the moon, they don't stay a constant 380,000 kilometers away. So they can approach the earth quite relatively uh, to a few, to a few uh, earth moon distances, some of them, some of them even closer. But then uh, they will may they have because they're in independent orbits about the sun, quite eccentric orbits, may be many years before a given asteroid becomes close to the Earth again. So this would, in terms of mining a given asteroid, this would complicate things. That the distance between the Earth and the asteroid is constantly changing, um, uh, and that's not the case for the Moon, obviously. Uh, 
On the other hand, nature has concentrated in the metallic near-Earth asteroids, iron, nickel, and the platinum group metals, and that's nature has concentrated in the carbonaceous near-Earth asteroids, the volatiles, uh, water, carbon, nitrogen, these will be very useful materials. On the other hand, the, in general, near-Earth asteroids are not concentrated in many of other useful elements, like um, lithophile elements, like aluminium, uh, titanium, the rare earth elements. I mean, they, they, they have these elements in their cosmic abundances, more or less, but they, 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 the asteroid bodies have lacked the geological processes to further concentrate these above their background levels. On the other hand, if we turn to the Moon, uh, the Moon is uniformly distant, uh, cl uniformly close to the Earth. It's always there. It's never going to go anywhere. Uh, lunar geological processes have enhanced the concentrations of many potentially useful materials, say the polar volatiles, aluminium, titanium, rare earth elements, um, in different places on the Moon. But then in addition, the Moon's own indigenous resources will be complemented, supplemented by crashed asteroids that may therefore be sources of iron, nickel, carbonaceous material, platinum group metals, and so on. But the, the wider point, and this is the, the final point I want to make, um, is that the Moon lends itself to the gradual development of a, a commercial and scientific infrastructure in the way that a given asteroid doesn't. Because the Moon is uniformly close to us, it's got a, a finite, a reasonable, modest gravita gravity of its own. It's got multiple uses, scientific uses, um, commercial uses, maybe tourism in the, in the, in the not, perhaps not as far future as we might think. So there are many reasons for wanting to go to the Moon and therefore it lends itself naturally to the development of a, um, a surface infrastructure that would facilitate the uh, acquisition of space resources uh, in a way that the, a given asteroid doesn't, because in a sense human activities on the surface of the Moon would provide a market for um, many space, um, space resources. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll finish there and I'm happy, of course, to answer any questions. Hello and welcome to Some Questions Answered on our International Asteroid Day live event. So here we're going to try and uh, discuss how difficult and how do you observe an asteroid? Uh, does it matter the site where I'm observing from and do I need a big telescope to find small asteroids? My name is Georgia Savini and I'm from the UCL Observatory and uh, I'll try and answer some of these questions. So you've seen in the previous talk, how do we recognize an asteroid and indeed how asteroids are generally portrayed. And that's by using a set of frames which are taken uh, in a given field. So uh, these are realigned so that the fixed stars uh, are uh, overlapping and they don't seem to move. And the only thing that moves effectively is the asteroid thereby identifying him, like in this case. This set of images was taken uh, by the Telescope Live uh, Robotic Network Telescopes and it's 1998 OR2, which was an asteroid, which was a uh, quite a large asteroid, which passed really close at 60 lunar distances from the Earth uh, just at the end of this April. Uh, likewise, this is a, a, an image of a much more deeper uh, field, a smaller asteroid. It was taken by the Linear Collaboration of the Linear Program uh, in 2016. And as you can see, they've highlighted the asteroid with a little ring to show where it is. Uh, the linear tracks here are uh, satellite tracks, which are much faster on the same timeline. These are examples of fairly bright cases, though, so cases where the asteroid is, uh, can be easily identified. Uh, when you have to go uh, further down to um, uh, asteroids which are just above the noise floor of the background, then differencing techniques become more common and they're often used. So if you take the first and the last frame of this set uh, and you subtract them from each other, you can see that apart from this sort of gray matte uh, level of background, um, you have the satellite tracks because they don't coincide uh, from one frame to the next. Um, but you also see highlighted the white and black dot, which is a positive and negative image resulting in the subtraction. And you see the one that's highlighted, but also another two asteroids, which uh, clearly have different speeds because the timing is the same for, for the frame. So you can see one of those there and the other one, you might have already spotted them somewhere down here. So um, to understand a little bit what's happening, uh, we have to oversimplify uh, the process in order to explain a few things. So imagine that you have your CCD uh, or your camera, your, your uh, imaging device, um, and this is uh, composed by pixels. And in our little picture here, 
the pixels are buckets and they're collecting rain uh, instead of light, which is what the pixel is doing. Um, in our case, the background of the sky background is an emission that it comes uniformly, roughly. Uh, statistically speaking, it's not exactly identical on each pixel. And that's important because that determines the noise of the variation of the background. But generally, you cover the entire image. Um, and then in addition to that, our star pours uh, its own light in a here in a pixel. We'll see in a minute in a, in a bunch of pixels, but generally in, in the pixel defining where the star is. So you can see an image, you can clearly see this is a source and the rest is the background. Um, the important thing is that this extra amount of photons need to be larger than those variations of the background. Now, an important point is the astronomical seeing of a site. Uh, in simple terms, what this says is that uh, atmosphere will have an effect. The light that is traveling towards your camera, enters your telescopes and deposits itself on the CCD, will have um, gone through different routes as it comes down in, in the atmosphere because there are layers of turbulence. There's air with different, var slight variations of index of refraction that effectively um, make light go through slightly different routes. And what that does, it spreads the light on the CCD. And effectively, that means that your, your star will not always arrive on one pixel, but it will arrive on a bunch of pixels. And that is what we term to the astronomical seeing or the size of that disk. So if we put the time on the x-axis and the counts on a pixel on the uh, y-axis, you'll see that um, uh, we have a fixed amount of, of noise, and then we have our sky background, which, as we said, increases with time, and the sky background noise, which also increases with time as the root square of the sky background. So if we have a bright source, it won't take long for that source to be easy ident easily identifiable above the background. A faint source, on the other hand, might take a, a little while before it becomes apparent. And of course, too faint a source will remain undetectable within the variations that we have uh, of the image in itself. Uh, so this is clearly, you know, a point that answers one of the questions, which is the sky conditions and the light pollutions are, are quite important on your site. In addition, asteroids move. So what happens is they stop pouring the light in a given pixel, a bunch of pixels, and they will start um, spreading it in other uh, adjacent pixels, therefore affecting resetting the counter and its contribution. So what happens tends to be something like this. If we consider the source persistence in a single group of pixels, then that um, steep counting of the of the light stops, and the only increase you get is effectively the contribution from the sky background. So what that tells you is that even faint sources will have a useful frame integration time. That after a while, you risk losing them again. So there's a tuning uh, exercise here, which is to try and optimize depending on the speed of the asteroids and you know what kind of asteroids you're hunting for. Uh, bright sources, on the other hand, have a different effect. So what happens for the bright asteroids is it leaves a streak in the image. And that's because once you've finished on one pixel or a bunch of pixels, um, it will go on to the next and then the next. And so these will reach the same amount uh, of counts and they will produce uh, a, a little stripe, which is what you can see here for asteroid 162082. Uh, which was in close approach uh, at the beginning of this year and was imaged by UCLO with a parent telescope. So you can also do a few clever things. Uh, if the asteroid won't stack its photons in one place, you can make it do so. And to do that, there's a technique called the synthetic tracking. And basically, you take an image, and if you know how the asteroid is moving, you shift the image bit by bit in that direction, effectively a workaround to the previous issue. Uh, and you can see this in this Jayatal paper from 2014, where a 90th magnitude asteroid is highlighted here and effectively transforming each star as a moving target. Um, this is a technique that will work uh, quite well. Uh, the question, of course, is how do we know in which direction you have to do the stacking by how much? Now, if you know where the asteroid is because you've, um, it has been predicted because its orbital elements are known, then it's, this technique is incredibly easy to apply. Uh, but if you don't, and you're in the game of discovering these asteroids, uh, then fortunately, um, this operation of, of trying by trial and error is not too uh, onerous for uh, today computer, today's computers, even uh, modest ones. So you can try a whole range of angles uh, times a whole range of different shifts. And eventually, if there is an asteroid to be discovered, it will come out like you can see in this image.
So to summarize, what are the things that help? Sight darkness, less sky background means fainter asteroids can be detected. Sight seeing, better seeing means the sharper images because the light is spread on fewer pixels. A telescope size, bigger funnel for the bucket and a field of view. It's a larger field, means more potential asteroids to find out there. Hope this has answered some of your questions and thank you for watching. Welcome back to our final Q&A session. I hope you've really enjoyed those. We've had some uh, amazing questions come. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start with one for Rami. Um, and one of the questions was, uh, can an asteroid be captured by a planet's gravitational pull and become a moon? So the short answer is yes. And in fact, if uh, I think Hillary already alluded to this in her talk earlier when she talked about Phobos and Demos. So we think that Phobos and Demos, the two moons of uh, Mars, are in fact captured asteroids. Uh, but uh, not only that, we actually expect and we think that most of the small moons surrounding the, particularly the gas and ice giants, are captured bodies from the Kuiper belt. So a lot of these bodies that started off in the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt through the perturbations, uh, gravitational perturbations, particularly with, the, with Neptune and Jupiter, end up migrating and uh, being captured by, uh, by planet and, and, turn, and they turn into moons. Thank you. Uh, we've had another question for Georgia actually about the temperatures that uh, um, so particularly when they're coming in through the atmosphere. Okay, uh, yeah that's a very good question. So um temperature of meteorites uh, depends what we're discussing here if it's fireballs themselves or if it's the objects once they reach the ground uh i think hillary went into a lot of detail with regards to the fact that you have different scenarios re with respect to how for example angle of attack in when they're entering the um the atmosphere and um Temperatures have been measured from a point of view of intensity in terms of uh, uh, quantity of light, so comparing these to black body emission. And uh, the average measurement of some of the fireballs that have been detected were in about the, the few thousand degrees. Uh, but then you have to differentiate in the case of, for example, if there is a flash, if there is an explosion, uh, then you can have much, much higher, uh, much more higher temperatures. So there have been some recorded explosions which measured more than six, seven thousand degrees, uh, and, and and that's with relation to the temperature of sort of uh, once they get into the atmosphere. Um, the the objects themselves, when they once they reach into the ground, is is different. It depends again in if if they uh, if they're slowed down and then they're free in free fall so you can have objects which are almost uh, ambient temperature once they reach the ground and others which reach the ground with uh, still a substantial amount of kinetic energy will be extremely hot so we had a really interesting question come in and i think hillary and francisco might want to join in this one uh, maybe uh, first uh, about elements um in um, meteorites that come through, is there any chance that there could be elements that don't exist on Earth? Um, I would say no, because the chemistry of the solar system is basically governed by the chemistry of the, uh, the primitive nebula that the solar system was formed from, and uh, that in turn uh, if we look at the Sun, we can figure out the composition of the Sun um, through spectroscopy. But we can also work out the composition of um, the most primitive meteorites, the ones that Ian was talking about, the CIs. And we find out that they're, they're, um, when you take away the hydrogen and helium, they're actually very, very similar. And we can actually detect all the elements that exist on Earth. We can uh, detect almost all of those in the sun. Um, and we find all of them in uh, the CI chondrites. So no, I don't think there's any, um, any unusual elements out. Uh, if I may uh, say something, I don't know if you can hear me because I couldn't hear Hillary very well, but uh, is that okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, well, look, look about new chemical and I have 
Uh, by chance, one of my uh, mouse mats is a, is a periodic table. And I say the atomic structure of all the chemical elements has been described and we know that the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nuclei of the atoms, all the uh, possible uh, chemical elements are in the periodic table. There is nothing missing there. There is nothing that hasn't been discovered. So that is a very important thing because that is a universal kind of, of, of uh, map that we have of the composition of the universe. Nothing, it's a kind of mineral, a kind of combination of molecules that happen in space that we are not aware of. That's a different story. But they, when it comes to chemical elements, I think they are all, they are all, um, they have all been uh, discovered. Thank you. And back to Hillary, there are some interesting questions about how the size and chemistry of the uh, chondral can tell us something about the impacts that have been going on um, in, in these bodies. Oh, do you want the five minute answer or the half hour one? Um, yes, yes. I mean, this is a, a subject that people have worked on extensively. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, once these chondrules have been made, they then get sorted um, and they get sorted according to their size and to a very minor extent according to their um, density. So they get sorted towards the middle of the plane of the solar nebula. Um, and so they, by the time they've been, uh, they've undergone that um, process, they can't really tell very much about the the um, impact on them. What we do know is that they're extremely abundant, so we've got to have a process that is a very common process in the solar nebula, in, in the early solar system. Um, and we also have to have a process that subsequently sorts them according to their size. Thank you. A, a sort of related question was about um, how do we know where some of these meteorites come from? So, for example, how do we know a meteorite on Earth has come from the Moon or, or, or Mars? Well, that's, yes, that's a fascinating topic. Um, well, the easy answer for the Moon is that we've had people go there and bring lunar rocks back. So the Apollo astronauts brought back lots of uh, materials that we've been analysing ever since. And the um, we can, so therefore we can compare the kinds of material we get in our meteorites to those rocks that are from um, the moon. So that's an easy one. We can compare them, um, you know, one and the other. Uh, Mars is a bit more difficult, but in fact, it has been shown that the meteorites, they're all a bit younger than the uh, 4.5 billion year um, age of most meteorites. We have a series of small, young, smaller meteorites, young meteorites, I mean, um, that are uh, that have glass in them, and in the glass, um, dissolved into the glass while the glass was still on its parent planet, Mars, um, it captured the uh, composition of the atmosphere. So we can actually liberate the composition of the atmosphere from the glass inside the meteorites and it agrees perfectly with the observed composition of the uh, atmosphere of Mars. So that uh, we don't have any rocks brought back from Mars yet. Although, you know, I mean, <laughs> I would really love to, um, to be there when the first Martian rocks are, are brought back from a, a, a mission. Um, but we don't need that, we can tell um, because of the, uh, the the gases involved in the um, in the the glass, the gas inside the glass gives it away. Thank you. And uh, another related question um, about differentiated ashes. Um, how do they acquire structure? What's, what's the research telling us in those guards? Okay. Well, differentiated asteroids. Um, are asteroids that were hot enough to start to melt. And the heat that they that help them to melt comes from impact, which is the, the, obviously you, you uh, turn the potential energy into kinetic energy, into heat energy. Um, and you also, um, so, so there's a lot of heat inside a uh, an impact. But there's also a thing called the 
um, short-lived isotopes, short-lived radioactive isotopes that were present in the solar system at the beginning of the solar system um, about four, four or five billion years ago. And there are two, um, aluminium-26 uh, and uh, iron-60, and they're very um, radioactive. Uh, they're so radioactive that they have now decayed away completely, so we don't have any of these, but we, we can determine from their decay products that they existed in the early solar system. And aluminium and iron are pretty common minerals, uh, common elements, and uh, they make up minerals of, um, of um, many asteroids. So if there was lots of um, uh, hot, uh, lots of heat from the, um, the decay of these two, Shortly radioactive isotopes, it would have heated up the interior of the asteroid. And then um, basically what we think happens is that the, the um, metal melts first and forms liquid metal, and that is um, drained down towards the center of the planet. It's dense, so under gravity it drains towards the, uh, the core. Uh, and that leaves behind uh, the silicate minerals which form the, the mantle. Um, and the crust. So you can, uh, we think that that's what happened to Vesta, um, and we think that that's what happened to a lot of other asteroids that have since broken up and, and dispersed. Thank you. Uh, we had a lot of interest in, in Ian's talk as well about some of the uh, questions that are coming up about some of the, the uh, aspects of ethics um, and what it's like and um, should we really be mining space. So before we start on that, I just wanted to talk about something. So how much do you determine what kind of elements are underneath these actually? You spoke about on the moon's surface, you have these uh, patches where different elements are. How, how do we know that and how have we determined that? Well, so we don't at the moment. I mean, at the moment, the, the work proceeds by trying to assign different meteorite classes. Obviously, we know what's in all the meteorites for all the reasons Hillary has said with great detail. Um, and then we try and assign those to particular asteroids based on the spectral properties of the asteroids. Uh, then, as Hillary said, we have to allow for the fact that space weathering affects the, uh, the spectral properties of asteroids. So you can't be absolutely certain. And that's kind of why it's important that these sample return missions like Hayabusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx bring back samples because that will help us calibrate the spectroscopy to make us more uh, confident that particular types of meteorites come from particular types of asteroids. And once we've assigned that, then we do know what's below the surface because we've got all these meteorites that we can measure uh, elemental abundances uh, to in great precision. Can I just say that we also know something Thank you. about... A linked question to that. Oh, sorry. Go on, Hillary, continue. Sorry, I was going to say that um, when an asteroid uh, impacts the surface of somewhere like the moon, it throws up material from deeper inside the moon. So we can actually see what's inside the moon by looking at what's been thrown out of uh, meteor craters. Thank you. And I had a linked question, which is that about the, um, the atmosphere. So obviously on the Earth, we've got this atmosphere, which is um, uh, causing these meteorites to burn up as they come through. To come through. How does that change? Them? And how might studying rocks from the, the moon or meteorites from the moon and potentially Mars in the future, uh, would that tell us anything different? It's a bit of a, uh, so maybe a bit for Giorgio about the thermal properties and Hillary about the actual chemistry mm -hmm. elements. Sorry, the, the the question, the first question you had is with regards to the difference between the impacts of uh, meteorites on the moon. Is that what you're asking? I think Ian would be better place to answer that one. <laughs> there are Ian. Or, or I can move on and answer the other so, question you Hillary, had. Uh, the chemistry. Um, yes, please do. 
Okay. Yes, please. So the other question that you had was about temperature of the asteroids themselves. Um, so there isn't a set value that that is uh, is considered to be the average temperature. I mean, it depends what you know which asteroids and which their conditions are. Uh, a short answer will be usually most asteroids are found in temperature around 200 Kelvin or about minus 70 degrees. But uh, truth be told, uh, they strongly depend from their compositions. Their albedo, which is basically how black they are with respect to the absorption, the emission of radiation. And then there is a there is a game that you play in terms of the estimation uh, because the asteroids will absorb light from the sun depending on their distance and then they will re-emit at their own temperature so you can get anything in between uh something which is about below uh, sort of a minus 100 degree centigrade to about ambient temperature on earth like 300 kelvin uh there have been measurements made with infrared uh, instruments like uh, elisa at a, at a temperature measured uh, between 285 and 290 something kelvin uh, and then again, uh, it depends on the rotation curve. So you, asteroids have a rotation time, which can be anything between uh, uh, sort of around an hour to uh, a few hours. And as we know from, from the moon itself, you, you can have a vast range of temperatures. If you think of the, the parts of the moon which are exposed to solar radiation are usually above 100 Celsius. And, and as Ian and, uh, and, uh, has shown earlier in the talk, you can have areas of the craters which never see uh, solar illumination, which are as low as uh, 40, 50 degrees above the absolute zero. So there is, you know, there's a, a very, uh, quite a variety of temperatures for the asteroids. Thank you. Uh, so population is about uh whether or not there is a governing body sort of uh I'll, I'll read the exact question is there a governing body for ethics protecting the space for scientific research over commercial exploration and mining and possible contamination so i think this one's definitely for you so no there isn't and and there should be so this is a really really important question uh, and it is a um it is something that's missing in international space law at, at the moment Activities in space are governed by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty of the United Nations. And this proposed put, put, put some restrictions on what nation national governments can do in space. Like you can't um, plant a flag in a planetary body and claim it as your own. You can't appropriate a planetary body under international law. But the 1967 treaty was um, was drawn up before commercial activities in space were imagined and when there were only really the United States and the then Soviet Union who could do it anyway. Um, and so the, the, the international law hasn't caught up with the new reality of, of, of space resource utilization. So it's a missing area in international law and, uh, and it needs to be, um, uh, this hole needs to be filled uh, as soon as possible in my opinion because I think there should be uh, clearly an international regulatory regime that does govern activities in space, commercial activities in space, partly uh, as the question alludes to, to protect sites of special scientific interest, um, but also to give the, um, the would-be commercial companies operating in space reassurance, clarity as to where they're allowed to operate and where they're not allowed to operate, because only when they have this clarity will they um, invest money in, in 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 their activities and i do come back to something a point that i tried to make in my my talk i do think science has an interest in these space commercial ent entities um, um pursuing some of these interests because by it, it is all about making money but but space exploration is expensive and unless we can get space to pay for itself somehow then our activities in space are likely to be much um, more restricted than what they would be otherwise. Having said that, of course, there needs to be a legal regime that protects special sites of uh, sites of special scientific interest, um, and uh, and there isn't one yet, and there should be. Francisco, would you like to add anything? Uh, fully agree with with Ian, of course, and. I will go a little bit even further because uh, um, 
I don't know if we are repeating what happened after the discovery of America, the continent, and we are now uh, going into space with a, with a commercial kind of um, uh, attitude that has uh, disastrous consequences, as we are leaving part of that. Of course, there are no rainforests to be destroyed in space, and uh, in the end, in the end, do we need more materials? Do we need more iron and nickel and aluminum and gold and the rest of it? We have plenty of recycling to do here, and we have to grow as humanity, in countries or individual companies. We should be going into space as a as a as a kind of a coordinated nations and collaborate. Space is very risky, expensive, and the more people, the more, the more uh, institutions you put there, the more countries you put there, the better. This is the example of Antarctica. This is example in a minute scale, if you like, on the International Space Station. It should be done like that. Imagine go to the moon. This is my territory. This is because you are invading my my country. Say in 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 on the moon. I mean, it becomes ridiculous if we extrapolate what we have done on this planet. So, can I, yeah, can I can I say something, Mark? Uh, yes, so, so I agree, of course. Of course, of course Francisco, we should be going out into space as a united humanity, and we have to have international um, institutions that will make that, uh, give some reality to that. So I agree, I agree with that completely. Uh, we, you, no nation state can claim a bit of the moon of its own. That that clearly would be in violation of the existing international law. So hopefully that's not likely to happen. But nevertheless, uh, you're right. We need a, we need to explore space as a united human species, and we have to develop legal and political institutions that will enable us to do that. But if I can just come back to the point you started with. Um, about do we need more metals and things? Well, the answer is no, we don't. Clearly, we don't need more iron on the earth or more nickel on the earth and probably not even any more platinum on the earth. Um, but that's not what space resources is all about, really. Space resource utilization is about mining things in space that we would need to use in space rather than having to lift it out of the earth's gravity. So the main economic arguments for using space resources are not to mine them in space to bring them to the earth, uh, but to mine them in space to use in space. So we have a decision before us. I mean, the, hum the united humanity has a, has a decision before us, and it's do we want to explore space or not? And do we want to explore space on a large enough scale that's sort of commensurate to the scale of space, which is enormous? Um, which will require a lot of large exploratory equipment, sort of bases on the moon and Mars and spaceships and all sorts of things. These, if we want to do that, we are going to have to utilize space resources to manufacture them. So that's the choice before us, really. Do we want to continue to explore space on a large scale? If so, we're going to need to use space resources. Or do we not want to explore space, in which case we can stay on our own little planet and not explore space, and then we don't need space resources. Thank you. So uh, there's two more yeah, questions yeah, I, I want fully to sort of agree, add uh, into uh, each other. So yeah, so the last last question is sort of more about the practicalities of it. So you've got to start constructing this infrastructure in space. How is that possible? And linked to that, would it does it involve manned missions, or or is this is there are other ways of doing this? So I I, I come back to so I think Ian probably well, is the best I, I, I'm, to that. I'm happy to make a start. Um, so a space infrastructure is going to have to be bootstrapped from essentially nothing because currently we don't have one, and in the more distant future we might want one that enables us to carry on our space exploration activities. So it's going to have to start slowly. Um, I think it, and it would start, I think, initially by utilizing water, either water from the poles of the moon or water from hydrated asteroids um, as, a, uh, as a source for fuel for space propulsion, so hydrogen and oxygen propellants. Um, whether we need humans in space, really, really, this really depends on what we want to do in space. If we want if we want to really explore space in the same extent that we like explore the Earth, 
then yeah, I would argue we need humans exploring space because we need humans to explore the Earth. Um, so, and, and then we'd need the resources that could facilitate that. If on the other hand, we don't want to explore space in a really large scale way, and we're content with what little robotic vehicles can achieve launched from the Earth, then we don't need humans in space, and then we won't need so many space resources. So really, it comes down to a choice. What, what is the human future in space? Do we, do we want one or do we not? Um, and then once we've decided what we want to do in space, this will decide the level of resources that we need. Unless anyone has anything else to add, I think that might be a perfect place to end it. Um, so thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I hope you've had a fantastic uh, time learning all about asteroids, uh, meteorites and uh, alike. Uh, any questions we didn't get around to ask answering, uh, we're going to try and up on our online, either in written form or um, small videos. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to send out another uh, information on Eventbrite about how to access all that information. Um, and a small evaluation as well, because I'd be really happy for you to um, be really grateful for you to receive information about how this day went. So thank you all again. Um, I hope you'd uh, give a small round of applause for all our speakers. Um, they've done a fantastic job today and um, in answering your questions as well. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at an event soon. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I have here in my hand a rock that looks at an ordinary rock, but if I look carefully and try to do something, for example, with a magnet, I realize that the rock is magnetic. It attracts. It's attracted by a magnet, and this magnet is attracting the rock. So this rock is made out of iron and nickel, which is a magnetic material. Now, if I go deeper and I can do the chemical analysis of this rock and measure the isotopic ratios of different chemicals in this rock, I find an astonishing thing. This rock was solidified, it was formed before the Earth was formed, more than four and a half thousand million years ago. So I'm holding here the oldest thing I will ever hold in my hands, which is a real meteorite that fell from the sky, left over from the material out of which our solar system was formed, out of which our own planet Earth was formed, and it landed and it was recovered. It's a real meteorite. Why is it important to know these things? Why is it important to know things at all? I think knowledge is something that is unique to the human race. We have here our brains, the far more complex, the most complex thing, the most complex structure, the most complex machine in the universe. And we use it to learn, we use it to understand the universe and just to know things for its own sake. Knowledge for its own sake is part of our culture, is part of our being human condition. So it is so important to know about these things leading to our own origins, the origins of our solar system, what is life in the universe, how this life can appear in other planets, in other places, how these rocks can form other solar systems as we know today. There are more than 300 solar systems discovered already around our, our own solar system. So will life appear in those places? Will we have aliens finally evidence for aliens that there is none so far we will find life in other places that's an amazing thing to know it's an amazing challenge in the future if we have any purpose on this life is to face those challenges and learn more and more about our fascinating universe